Welcome back, everybody. It's, Don't you try to steal the, the uh, intro from me, Chris. You I was just going to say, it's all the game memes that mouth. I keep sending him in the background <laughs> on Instagram. That's why we, it's like, I'm really getting to know this guy. <laughs> I'm really getting to know him because of all the terrible memes. Welcome back, everybody. One's Ready Podcast. It's me. It's Trent. It's our good friend from I Came With Fire, Common Freaking Sense, 18 Delta, Prior, all kinds of other stuff. Chris Hambrock, welcome. How you doing? Hey, I am doing awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, of course, man. Love all the projects you've been with. We've been friends for a while. We were co-located yeah. for a little bit. So you and I have had the distinct pleasure of sharing some beers around a fire, which I cherish. I think I, I think believe, that's a cool thing. I, I want to say that you were drinking some kind of like super seltzers. fruity tootie drink. That's right. 100%, 100% seltzers. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I made sure. Pounds? Like, how is this fun? I don't understand. <laughs> Obviously. He didn't even seltzer. actually drink them. He like bent over and he was like, can you just give me my seltzer in the way that I'm used to receiving them. And I'm like, exactly. Aaron, I just met you, but right. 18 Delta, dude, I actually have some lube in the closet. So yeah, yeah. I got this ready to go, dude. Little surge of lube. It's, it's no problem at all. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think like, just to make sure that I was at the farthest possible edge that I could go to, it was also a Bud Light seltzer. So I mean, this we were just, we <laughs> were all the way, like as if Bud Light wasn't water enough, they made a seltzer, uh, at, at like at the request of Effing it's nobody. True. You know yeah, what I mean? Can't beat me. I'm hydrated. Hydrated, Sarge. Yeah, right, Chris, man, tell tell everybody that you know hasn't listened to your projects over either at Common sure. Freaking Sense or I Came With Fire. Man, tell us how you uh, found yourself in the Army because you got a great story. Oh, man. Uh, well, so it all began 3,000 years ago with the forging of the Great Rings. Uh, oh. <laughs> no, so uh, I, um, I was actually going to Bible school. Uh, I went to Bible school for two years at Indiana Wesleyan University. Uh, at the time, I was trying to be a musician uh, and like a public speaker. I was on the route to become like, you know, uh, the next great, uh, I don't even know what you want to call it, like celebrity youth pastor, I guess. And uh, well, that dream didn't work out uh, at all. I ended up dropping out of school, <clears throat> got married. Um, and found myself working like five jobs to include two construction jobs. At the time, the music career wasn't taking off. Uh, the bills started racking up and I was like, man, I've got to do something different. I'm like, God, why did I make these these terrible life choices? And God was like, I'm not the one that told you to quit school. And Don't look at me, know. bro. <laughs> yeah, no, right? like, you did this to yourself. Quit, quit trying to shift the blame, buddy. Like I gave yeah. you all the, all the, <laughs> everything that you need to fix this problem. Right. And now you're blaming it's me. Yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's the old meme. It's like, why do you keep giving me your toughest battles? And God was like, yeah. You literally are the one that did all of this. You're, I didn't you literally did all you, of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I walked into uh, the recruiting office. Um, originally was talking to the Air Force, uh, and the reason that I diverted off that path was the Air Force. I actually did all of my recruitment process through them. Took ASVAB through the Air Force. Uh, uh, did the initial PT tests and all of that stuff like through them. And the the reason I ended up like ripcord and hard left face on that one was uh, when the recruiter came back and told me that she was like, well, here's a uh, pick your top three and maybe you'll get one of these, right? One of these jobs. Like that was the deal that I got at the time. And I was like, Ooh, I'm really not, uh, I'm really not liking the, uh, the not being able to pick my own adventure thing about this. And yeah. like, before I give my life away, like, I'd really like to know at least who's effing me from behind you know it's like i i at least had that much look lady like, things it's... are not going well already i don't want to yeah. keep taking here all right right yeah you're you're literally like this, kicking me while i'm down lady this train like, we... this train is already five deep like i don't need to add another caboose onto it you know so uh so that's where uh i, I basically left uh i had all of my family members that served were all prior marines so as i was like going through the process my dad made me promise he was like whatever you do for the love of god please don't become a marine and i was like okay that is at least one uh one promise that i can keep and then i'm just not gay enough to join I the navy keep I like a tally of everybody that had like marine or army parents that were like just make me one promise not right. this service that i was in. yeah it's a really good, yeah i'm sure i'm sure the list is is probably pretty long it's it's pretty funny because you guys probably get that's probably like your biggest recruiting tool right you're like, ah, well, I want to be in the military, but <laughs> hey guys, the Marines are we're not yeah, the, the Marines are too tough, yeah, and the Navy's too gay. So that's <laughs> and that's how I wind that's, up here. Like <laughs> fantastic. That's the second one we're gonna have to bleep out because on this podcast we get in trouble for saying stuff like that. So we'll, oh, we'll I pretend you said something else. I can't say gay here. You can in the pejorative, but typically we get nasty but grams you, for stuff like that. Oh maybe so happy. <laughs> that's what we're talking about. Just a bunch of okay. happy people on a boat. Thank you. Thank well, God. I'm, setting, I'm setting the tone early, boys. Like this yeah. is how we do over on Common Freaking Sense. And I came with 
fire. Like it's literally Solid. called I came with fire. So yeah, all right. That's cool. If well guys, I- if you guys if you guys can't take being called gay, like <laughs> why are you listening to these podcasts with this with this group of people? <laughs> You're in the wrong circles, my man. <laughs> oh geez. Anyway, so uh there you were. Uh, yeah, that, so, yeah. that, that is the that is the funniest thing though the the, uh, the classic like uh, joke about the air force is like I loved being in the air force because it was almost like being in the military you know what <laughs> I mean like if if I hadn't done the job that I did you know I, I don't know if I right. want to be in the military they're like oh yeah being being in the air force it's almost it's really really close to being in the military and that's yeah. really the biggest draw yeah it's like diet it's like diet military like military <laughs> it is, light, yeah right it, military yeah. light yeah that's pretty yeah. good. Sure. Uh, yeah. So no shit. There was uh, diverted off the path because she gave me like the the pick your top three, and I and I wasn't really having that, and I left. And then the uh, the army recruiter from uh, Staff Sergeant Hamilton. I still remember this dude was. He looked a lot like you, Aaron, which is really funny. The first time I actually met you, ugly uh, and stupid. I was, or I was like, I was like, this guy has got one of those slappable faces, just <laughs> like Staff Sergeant Hamilton. No, like, you're was- right. <laughs> I have a very punchable face. Yeah. That's what yeah. we call it. Yeah. He totally like slid into the hallway, like on his office chair and did the whole, like, have you met Ted and just like snagged me, scooped me up like a, like a wayward salmon making my way upstream. And it, and it was, it was all downhill from there. And he showed me the, uh, the EOD recruitment videos. And back at the time I was going through the, like the very naive, like, I want to make a difference, like on Starship Troopers, you know, it's like, I, I'm doing my part. Like I really wanted to. And this is also 2011. So we're G- like at the very crest of, of G what like things are hopping and popping. This is also back during the time where if you joined the military, like you were 100% going to Iraq or Afghanistan. Everybody was everybody. When I joined the military had that, had that combat patch, had the cab, had the CIB. So it's like, we all knew what we were getting into. And I just remember thinking, I'm like, dude, if I'm going to do this, right. Like I'm going to do it for real. Like natty guard is not for me. Like I'm, I'm going to go all the way. Uh, and if I'm going to go into the army, like, man, like give me a job where I can actually make a difference. Like I, I want to help people. And I originally tried to be a medic, like from the off. Uh, but dude, like got me to believe that there was no slots for medics at the time. Somehow I'm like, like people are still dying in Afghanistan. Right. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, and I'm like, then how are there no slots for medics? How, how are there no slots? Aren't, the, aren't those people still assigned to infantry battalions? Don't yeah. you still need those people? For some reason, he already got one that month, and he's like, "Ooh, that was nice." I don't need another one of those. Yeah. So, but they were doing the huge push for EOD at the time. Uh, so the dude sh- boys. Yeah, the dude showed me the video of like all that shit blowing up, and my dick got really hard and just smacked the desk from the underside, and I was like, "Hey, that son, have you seen the Hurt Locker?" Yeah, That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> A dude walks in there and he grabs the he grabs the plastic wire. It's like he's surrounded by all five shells and just pulls them up. <laughs> oh my god! And anybody that's ever worked with an explosive just like died inside. <laughs> like, anybody that had any common sense about them at all when they watched yeah. the hurt locker, they were like, "Oh, tight. Hey, look at that huge industrial building. How many people do you think we need to clear this? I don't know. Two. Two. Yeah. yeah. Max. Two. <laughs> we got this, dude. Let's go. He was he was wearing a ranger tab in that. In that movie too, wasn't he? If I remember, he was. I will have to look back and watch it again. Yeah, don't, don't go, don't go back, <laughs> don't it, go back. Yeah, that hurts. It's so bad. I don't know. It, it's one of those uh, experiences where, after having been in the military for almost fourteen years, it's probably so ridiculous. It's funny, like yeah. a spoof yeah, at this right. point. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I love too. At the, at the, there was a distinct period, and I can't remember when, but it was like really in vogue, and it was about that time period to look at like every people were doing these long reaction videos of like every oh, single yeah. thing that was wrong in this video. And now I just watch crate, like I watch you know whatever you know, show that has a tactical scene in it, and I yeah. just laugh. I'm like, oh well, you know, they tried. At least they're pointing their gun in the right way, and the EOTech's not on backwards, but which is better than you know <laughs> the Navy. But whatever. I was just gonna say it's better than that <laughs> PR picture the Navy put the out, Navy. which was was real <laughs> <laughs> right like right. lens cap is closed the guy's got his eye right next to it is fantastic hey so Optic what did you actually get in- <laughs> what what did you get into it to to do to gen up signing the eod contract or what did you do yeah i did i signed that that uh was it 89 delta right yeah 89 delta contract eod uh i made it through went to basic training at fort jackson in south carolina and graduated, went to the EOD uh, at the time. They were, I think they were calling it pre EOD school. They were trying to make like a uh, like a selection light kind of program. Uh, they moved it from the what was it the tr- uh, what, Fort Eustis or whatever is where it used to be. I think I don't speak Army, dude. I'm straight. 
No, I'm trying. Yeah, I know, right? I mean, it's like man, there's don't a, speak EOD. I EOD. Yeah, I yeah there's. It's like I can't cow. understand you. Get the dick out of your mouth. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, it was it was it's the it's the the fort that was in Alabama. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, and the internet will correct me, and that's fine. You guys get so mad. It's like everybody loves to get. Well, actually, hold on, you know. But whatever, I don't care, guys. Like, sue me. But it was down there at the time. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. And then they moved it to Fort Lee, Virginia. Uh, just like months before I came through the program. So that's where I went. It was like a, it was like a 12 week program, like kind of pre-selection thing you had to do. Like they strapped you in the bomb suit. You had to like run around, do a bunch of, you guys don't want me to say gay anymore. They make you do like a bunch of retarded stuff while you're there. (laughs) And, um, this is gonna be this is gonna be the best members only episode that we've ever made. This is, I'll tell you what this is this is gonna be the best episode that never sees the light of day. Uh, All and right. just quick quick quote from Dave. Like when we get dragged on Twitter and Reddit, you know, quick quote from Dave Chappelle. Hey, one's ready. You shouldn't have said all that stuff, and now you're getting dragged on Twitter. Well, Twitter's not a real space, so shut up. It's not real life. The, the last start- member we had on here dropped the f bomb every three words. I'm pretty sure. I, just, I, try not, I try not to do that because I still have to sit in lots of meetings with, yeah. you know, state department folk and people that make a lot more money and wear a lot nicer clothes than me. And so I, I do have to like <laughs> kind of learn how to play the role, you know? Well, you know, what's funny about this, and this is but, just a weird thing that like, there are going to be people that are going to get super poo poo about, you know, saying things like, you know, the words that you just used. I didn't have a single person. I feel like you're just baiting me into saying it again. I know. That's all you want. (laughs) I didn't have a single, no, not a single person. So I did a a great interview with Seth Gale from beyond the show. Go beyond the shadows. That guy's got a ridiculous story. That guy spoke in real terms about grooming, rape, and sexual assault. Not a single person was like, you can't say that. We didn't get to monetize like none of these things. Right. It was totally fine. But you saying, (laughs) you know, gay and retarded is going to, is going to cause a firestorm. Like that's where we are with life. So I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Uh, I'm just trying to help you guys out. Like I'm down here. I'm you down are here. not helping us out. I'm at down all. here. Let me be clear about this. You are not helping us out at all. I'm down here fighting midgets in the mud, and I'm just trying to like drag you guys back down to my level, so that way I can, I can climb the social media ladder just a little bit. It's really not elevating me. It's it's about pulling you guys back pulling down. Pulling everybody else down, right? Right. right. So then, by <laughs> comparison, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a real crab pot sort of scenario. You're not <laughs> trying to get out. You're just trying to drag everybody else down. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So no shit. There was, um, <clears throat> Fort Lee, Virginia. I went through the EOD selection portion, uh, made it through that fine. There, there was, some, there was a little bit of drama that happened while I was there, but I mean, it's just like, like student drama, just kind sure. of learning to be in the military kind of stuff. And, uh, EOD because of like, by virtue of working with all the services, like you go to the, to the Naval school, like everybody goes to NAV school EOD in England air force base down in, in Florida, which was awesome to be there. But because of that, like joint environment, uh, it's a different, like my baptism into the, into the army. Wasn't most people's where it's like, come in and then you, you get beat down and you get like army eyes. It's like my, coming into the military was like, here, welcome to the joint military environment, which is really one of the things that shaped me to this day, because it's like from the off, like I spent, you know, three months at, uh, <clears throat> at basic training. And then those, uh, what, like eight weeks, I think I said it was like eight, nine weeks or something, uh, in Fort Lee, Virginia. And then it was immediately down to Eglin air force base. Uh, and I remember showing up, I think it was like a, it was a Wednesday, um, and they, they like the the bus just kind of drops you off at Eglin Air Force Base, uh, and then I'm like, okay, cool, and I'm I'm there with like my my two army sea bags, you know, like my my gear, everything that I own in the world, as it were, <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, where do I go? And they're like, go to the quarter deck, idiot, and I'm like, cool, what's the quarter deck? <laughs> hey, I'd love like, to. Get- where is that? Yeah, you guys have like, first of all, isn't a quarter deck on a boat? And they're like, it's the nav school, and I'm like. You guys have boats on the on the base. Like I like, am I going to the? Because I can see the the ocean from where I'm at. It sits right on right on the coast. And they're like, no, it's up the hill. And I'm like, I am by far so confused right now. I don't know what's wrong with you guys. And they're like, look, look, idiot. Every every uh, building that has a mast out front is a ship, and so you report to the quarter deck. And they're saying it slowly. As if that makes what they're saying make like, any more right, sense. Flagpole. It's not a right. Map. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool though. And I'm like, 
like stop talking to me like I'm an interpreter in Afghanistan, dude. Like just because you say it more slowly doesn't make it. <laughs> make nothing more makes sense. nothing makes me happier than watching some arrogant American <laughs> go abroad. I saw this in Europe all the time, and they like you know they they'd say something, and the person would be like, "Oh, sorry, no English," and then they 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 just talk slower and louder. They'd be like, "I want." the hamburger <laughs> and they, you'd be like dude that doesn't help my dude he speaks swahili what do you what do you think talking oh, slower is gonna do my bad mm, mm, mm. yeah whatever <laughs> jeez this is members only that's you know that's just what it is let's get let's keep going you you say swahili <laughs> not swahili no, jesus it's my, it's all my right, best hey, interpretation all right so, so anyway, I found the boat on the hill with the mast out front and I walk inside and a uh, dude like hands me my, my freaking, uh, my birthing. I'm like, what am I having a kid now? Like, I honestly mm-hmm. don't, you guys keep using these Navy words and I don't know what it means, but he's like, you're barracks, dude. It's on up the hill, go up there. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, when you hear the thug music, just follow that. And when you see the block party, you've arrived. This is a Wednesday and the sun's not even down yet. All right, so I got I got to set the set the tone here. So sure sure enough, I walk outside and you can hear like the inner city like gangster rap like just bumping like down the hill and I'm like, "Okay." I walk up there. Like there are dudes that are like in their skibbies like just hanging out, music is thumping, the barracks is in that U shape, you know, it's like three three levels stacked. Uh, and as I get up there, it's just like there are Bud Light, Miller Light, PBR cans everywhere. It looks like a trash heap <laughs> on a Wednesday on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> some dude stumbles out of his barracks and pukes over the third railing. Like standard. Pretty good. Dude, so, so you walked I, into a pretty good like Margarita Wednesday party. So pretty yeah, good. I don't see any so problems with this. It's it's hump day at Nav School EOD, man. Let's like, go. That's, that's what it is. The coolest thing I've ever heard about EOD, actually. <laughs> it actually is. Yeah. Well, and what I didn't realize at the time was they they put me in the the out of training barracks. So these are all the dudes that are waiting to class up in between classes, have gotten dropped or in, are in trouble with the military. You know, they're they're basically in military purgatory for you know because you guys I know in the in like the Air Force pipeline, you guys do everything in kind of like stages, right? So it's like you'll bounce out to this school when it opens up and then come back, and then it's like you don't do it in like a standard kind of format. Yeah, there's there's a little wiggle room to it. It depends on class seats and and where gotcha. you are. And yeah, okay. Yeah. There's so there's like uh, one guy a year that has like back to back courses and makes it through the pipeline in like nine months, and the rest of everybody else is like eighteen month pipelines because you know right. logistics and planning. And, and yeah, then he yeah. walks around like he's better than everybody else, and you're just like, screw <laughs> you, man. <laughs> you were the chosen one. <laughs> Luck of draw. Luck of the draw. MF. So, so you get there with uh, this this what sounds to be like the island of wayward toys or you know misfit toys. Hey, yeah, yeah. How, how oh, did, you're you're nailing it. Yeah. How how did you uh like how, how did it, that set the tone for what you're doing? You're just like you're looking around. You're like, okay, I'm an army guy on a navy base. I'm in this this dorm with a whole bunch of people that have different goals than I am. <laughs> what was like the next step? Like, I imagine that didn't set off the EOD trip very well. No, it well, it actually set the tone for the next nine months of my life like perfectly. So I I walked into my barracks room. I found it. I walked in, uh, and you know, standard like at, at least I was in there by myself. Like I didn't have a roommate at the time, which was very nice. And I was waiting on my wife to move down. Uh, we ended up living in Crestview, Florida, which is like fifteen miles up the road, like inland. Um, Kentucky, <laughs> dude, it speak. gets. It gets super country super quick in Florida. Like when, the first time we drove into uh, Crestview, I saw a kid riding a pig. <laughs> I was like, what? ring-a-ding, ding, ding, ding. Was he a ranger? Sorry, that was a very, I, that was a very layered joke. <laughs> nailed it. So, um, but yeah, I just kind of walked into the barracks room. I sat down and put my bags on the bed and I just kind of sat at the edge of the bed and stared at the wall. And I was like, oh my God, like, what do I do? Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, and uh, some, some guy walks in. He was like, hey, you're the new dude. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And he goes, cool. We're going to um, the Matador. That's what it was called. The Matador. And I'm like, OK. And he's like, he's like, get your shit. Let's go. And I'm like, uh, what is the Matador? First of all, I have so many questions. Is it down by the quarter deck? Because I just came by there. And he's, he's like, no, it's a strip club, idiot. And I'm like. Oh, and I have like one hard rule in my life because I'm happily married. I got four sons at this point. Uh, and my marriage is the one thing that I have not screwed up at some point in the military. And I'm very protective of it. Right. And I looked at the dude and I was like, ah, I don't do 
I don't do strip clubs, my man. And, uh, you know, he cussed me out and, you know, what are you, uh, definitely can't drop the F word on here. Yeah, no, yeah. You, no, you okay. Can't. You know what I, I was, appreciate. You saw, you saw yeah. where that was going immediately. I saw, <laughs> I saw the hard F forming with your face and I was like, easy, Chris, easy, Chris. Easy, like, Jeez, Sunday always, there's only so many slurs we can get away with before people yeah. start to really get mad at us. Who do you think I am? The Pope, dude, <laughs> calm down. It's going to be fine. <laughs> no. Great joke. That dude's a gangster. <laughs> what, a, what an absolute great reference. I'm so- <laughs> All right. Continue. So, so we, we make it through that. Uh, I was only in the out of training section, I think, for like two weeks before I classed up, you know, PT test, all that jazz. We make it into school. And then EOD school is actually one of the hardest uh, experiences that I've ever been in in my life. Like those dudes and, and I'm not mechanically minded, which is the thing that like really screwed me over um, because it's like, they'll just show you, you go into land division for instance. And it's like, okay, the first five days, anything that is thrown uh, or is placed in the ground as an explosive, you're going to learn all of it. And so they always like when I was there, at least so it's like, we're going to start with hand grenades and projectiles, rifle grenades, all these things. And so they show you the fuses or the bulk explosives, right? And like, here's all the bulk explosives. Memorize these three pages of uh, military acronyms for this, right? This one's an M67, the M34, so on and so forth. And then you got to memorize every safety that goes with it for this one because, you know, it's a fragmentation grenade. You have your frag safeties, your high explosive safeties. It's EOD school, so spoiler alert, everything has frag and HE in it. But, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, and then, you know, this one has fire that, that comes with it if it's the thermite grenade, so on and so forth. So you got to memorize all of that information and you get you know, 48 hours and it's like, okay, cool. Come back. And it's like, here's this 50 question test on it. Uh, and you have to get, I think it was below above an 80, 84. Yeah. 84%, you know, out of a hundred in order to pass this test, fail it once you get one retake, fail it twice. Class can't wait for you. Good luck. We'll see you in the next one. Academic review board. Right. Uh, and, and it just rolls like that. Like the, the, the train is fast. And I, I thought having two years of college under my belt, uh, would have given me an advantage, right. For military style learning. I was, I was woefully, woefully inadequate and ready for the fire hose. That is the military style of education. But I will say this. I am so glad every single step of my military career has been like placed by God. And I, and I truly believe that because looking back on it, you know, people say all things happen for a reason, but I truly believe it because it's like, if I hadn't had EOD and been in the joint environment and learned how to learn in the military, which is really what that education was for me, then I wouldn't have made it through the 18 Delta pipeline later. And if I hadn't, you know, gone to get my Ranger tab and failed at getting my Ranger tab, then I wouldn't have learned how to do the special operations like selection style process right like i wouldn't have learned how to um how to take care of my body and like how important recovery is and you know all of that stuff that got me ready for the pipelines and the selections that i did later on right which which i did end up passing so it's like each initial failure that i had in the beginning set me up for a longer term success and as uh stop saying gay chris as dumb as that sounds uh i'm glad for every failure that i had because it's turned dividends like later on. And so that that's what it was for me. So long story short, with the EOD process, uh, I went uh, all the way. To, I was like uh, eight weeks out from graduation or something like that. I was going through the air division. So we were learning. Uh, no, I had just graduated the air division. We were getting ready to go into IEDs, which is really where you start making your money. Because uh, just improvised explosives and, and how to deal with all of that, which... Once you get through the conventional explosive side, you go into the improvised side. It's like there really are no rules. Like the rules are. Was there a lot of that going around in 2011, 2012? I don't remember. IEDs? Yeah, I seem to. I've heard it. It was like one of the only things that I had heard about before joining the military. I was like, oh, I know that acronym. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I heard that one on the news. Yeah. Uh, And that's where uh, I ended up running into uh, my first legal trouble in the military. Um, and I ended up getting pulled out of class and placed under armed guard, like honest to God, armed guard and escorted off of the compound. And then, uh, found myself in my first, uh, clearance investigation and my first, uh, military 15, six investigation. 
And it was all due to a false accusation, which was really fun. And so that was my, uh, my first taste of how this, the, uh, the system, when it turns against you, right, can absolutely screw you. I, I almost said the hard thing. They didn't treat yeah. you like you were innocent first. That's weird. They just heard something. Innocent, somebody said something, and because until you're you and you guilty. look like you, you were Dude, under I got arrest the, immediately. I got the Donnie T treatment, bro. Like the straight up thirty four counts, guilty on all. Uh, yeah. So, so the long and the short of it was, uh. I had an instructor that accused me of taking my my phone into a classified training area, and the military takes its its classified areas very seriously. This area wasn't even a skiff; it's actually an outdoor training facility, but it's it's behind the fence, right? Everything posted, no cell phones in here, uh, and it, it was a complete lie because what I had actually done. My wife was uh, going in that morning; we, she was pregnant with our first son. And uh, she was going in to have the ultrasound. We were going to find out the sex of the baby. So <clears throat> you get the same briefing every morning when you're there. Uh, it's like, hey, um, all cell phones need to stay outside in the box. Uh, if you need to be excused, take an emergency call or you know something's going on, please just let an instructor know. No harm, no foul. We can excuse you from class. Or if, if it's something that you need access to immediately, you need to be alerted, we can keep the phone in our office. And then if it rings, somebody can come get you. You can be excused from the training area, go handle your business and then come back. And I was like, cool. So I talked to my instructor as a civilian instructor at the time, you know, and I was like, Hey, sir, this is what's going on. Sex of the baby. Uh, I'd really like to find out. I'm really excited. No problem. Took my phone, put it in the office. Well, I guess at some point my phone rang <clears throat> and this is where I really effed up because young, naive me didn't have a screen lock on my, on my iPhone at the time. Classic mistake. Uh, yeah, I got such an education out of this. So some some instructor that really, for whatever reason, I guess he came into a, maybe maybe his wife was sleeping around on him. Like Jody got him really good. You know, I don't know what kind of life situations he was going through, but he basically Can we at came least say work. allegedly. Jesus, dude, just say allegedly. Just Alleg all right, allegedly. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to drop the guy's <laughs> name. <clears throat> anyway I, I don't know but he he decided that he was going to come into work that day and he was just going to screw somebody's life down like that was the point he's just like i'm just looking for somebody to dick down and then bam like here comes little old naive me and just wound up squarely in those crosshairs and i got both barrels so <clears throat> dude starts going through my phone he finds some messages between me and another student he's like reading my texts probably looking at my oh i really should not say that <clears throat> Because Hannah listens to these, um, but he was looking—he was looking at everything. All right, so <laughs> and uh, looks through these text messages, and and I had that's, ended up that's academically weird. going through everything. Man, he was going through everything, and uh, he found a text message stream between me and another student, a buddy of mine. I had gotten academically rolled at one point during that course already, and the dude asked me what happened, and I told him I was, oh, I, you know, without saying what ordinance and like dropping test questions i was like uh idiot me i forgot to insulate a fuse while i was doing something that's exactly what i said so i wasn't giving away any information no test answers like anything like that but it was like it was veiled like when you're in the community you know like you can say certain words and they're buzzwords and then the other guy kind of knows what you're talking about without having to come out and explicitly say it and that's, that's what we were doing right uh and so this dude finds that basically walks in you know where is private Hambrock? I'm like, I'm right here, Sergeant. Don't know what's going on. Come with me. Places me in the uh, the testing facility with all the computers. Brings in an armed guard. Puts me under armed guard. I still don't know what's going on at this point. Uh, they bring in an officer. The guy reads me the 15-6. Like, this all happened, like, within hours. And I'm just like, I, I don't know what is going on. It's like, you are formally being investigated for... Uh, they read me, like, the list of charges. Um, taking my phone into a classified training area, violating school policies, like all this. And you're to be escorted off the premises. Uh, you are no longer like your, your badge is revoked. They took that from me immediately. Uh, took me to my car and had the MPs follow me off the compound until I got back into uh, onto the street. Right. And I basically spent the next 30 days. 
Well, actually, I do got I I do got to shout out one guy that absolutely saved my career. So I went back. Uh, last time I saw this dude, he was a first sergeant, but at the time he was a sergeant first class. I went back to the uh, the holdover area where I started the block party, and I had to go check in at the quarter deck again, right? And so it's like we each have our platoon, our uh, platoon sergeants or whatever. And so I went and I talked to him, and uh, he goes, he sees me walk in the door, and before I can even go at ease, he's like, he's like, you come with me right now. We walk out in the hallway, and he goes, Hambrook, I don't know what you did, I don't know what's going on, but he goes, this sh- shit stinks. He was like, I have never seen anything like this before. He goes, if I were you, you need to go call. And he hands me a number and he was like, do not call Jag. Call these guys. And he, he gave me like a real quick down and dirty primer. He was like, you are being investigated. Jag is going to come after you. Jag cares about the command. He was like, these guys will take care of your legal needs and they're, they're for you. And he goes, if you need anything from here on out, we can only talk officially. He was like, that's the only non-official thing I can tell you. Dude saved my entire career right there in in one go. So shout out, you know who you are. Uh, I made something of myself, Dad. So uh, appreciate you. Oh, that's a, that's a nice that's a nice yeah. uh, you know button up to this story. That was nice of you to say. Yeah, um, he's still like I don't remember yeah. you at all. So I went. Really? <laughs> I, th- I think about you every day. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> I don't I, <laughs> probably. I don't think about you at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically spent the next uh like 35 days uh in my in my apartment under investigation. So I I would drive to formation in the morning, check in, uh leave, go back to my apartment, drive back to formation at 1600, check in, drive back to my apartment. I did that for about 2 weeks and then finally my platoon sergeant was like, "Where do you live, Crestview?" He was like, "Just send me a text." And so then I just, I was just texting it. So I got to do COVID before COVID was COVID before everybody else got locked down. Like I had already been through that once. Like I was ready to go, dude. I'm like, oh, I know how this goes. Uh, and so made it through the investigation and basically what they found, there was, there was two things that happened. One, it came out that they illegally searched my phone and where, where they really effed up because they probably could have gotten away with it was when the commander that was assigned to do the investigation tried to get me to sign a search warrant and the military it's called a search authorization tried to get me to sign a search authorization after the fact they called that's, me in and he said he how this works buddy <laughs> he slides me a pa- he slides me a paper and uh, on the paper, it was authorization for search or seizure. And he's like, I need you to sign this. And on the paper, it, it had this like long story. It's written in like memorandum format that basically said that I was in classroom. My phone rang while I was in classroom. The instructor heard my phone ring, immediately reprimanded me, and then turned me over to the cadre that, uh, you know, it was basically like, why do you have this phone? Why is it in the classroom? Why is it in a, a classified training area? Upon that point, they seized my phone, and as the stu- like, this is all the story that's it's in this memo. As I handed the phone over to them, they just happened to see text messages on the screen of me sharing classified information. And I looked at the I looked at the officer, and I was like, I, I didn't say this at the time, uh, but in my head, I would have said it if I was braver. Like now, trust me. But back then, I was like, I was like, you must think I'm the dumbest. You must think I'm so stupid, right? Yeah. Like, you must think I'm the dumbest person on the face of the planet. Like I've never, I right. don't know what the fourth amendment is. I don't know yeah. how these things <laughs> happen. Like you want me to sign a piece of paper to justify your insane and overreaching right. act, illegal actions. Oh yeah. Give me a pen, idiot. Well, to be fair at that point, I had turned my phone over to somebody with no screen lock on it. So I'm really not flying high on common sense at the point, but, yeah, I, but your, I, your I, comsec opsec is not good. Like your, your comsec <laughs> msec opsec is not good. <laughs> It's gotten way better. It's gotten way okay, better. Trust me. Yeah, but that, I had to go to I, I had to go to the school of hard knocks for this. So. Well, let me ask you: Do you still have a Do you still have Face ID on your phone? Are you still opening your phone with your face? Uh, I have it. I yes, I have you, it on no, my phone better, at home. Okay, you're still stupid. You're still dumb. But, what are you doing? Six digit code. That's it. I mean, you you are correct. No, I haven't. I'm, said, I'm I, aware. That's why I said it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> That's true. It's the so, convenience, man. They got me the, the velvet handcuffs. They're so, so I got you. Those, is how many folks have you known in the military that did sign that paper or did do something stupid or went to JAG instead of like an actual lawyer? Uh, we, we talk about this all the time. And as you become like an NCO and a senior NCO, like, you know, like, like that one guy helped you out. It's like half of your job is just making sure that the lower enlisted don't get crushed 
by the system that doesn't care about them. It's true. Yeah, no, 100%. And uh, what was really funny is after I looked at him and I said, sir, with all due respect, I'm not signing this. And he goes, Private Hambrock, I'm ordering you to sign this search authorization. <laughs> and I was like, sir, is this being recorded? Are we being recorded right now? Because I'm like, sir, I'm, I've, I've spent the last, at this point, I'm like, I've spent the last week reading. I, I, went, to, I went to the primer on, on military law on the UCMJ. Like I had nothing to do except sit in my in my room. Like you guys recused me to my quarters, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, yes, I've played a lot of Skyrim, and right. I kick ass at that now. But also, I did me some reading. Right. But you and forced I, me to become a barracks lawyer, yeah. so here yeah, I am. I yeah. just got, I just, I just got my yeah. I just, the law offices of Chris Ambrock. They, just go left at the quarter deck. You'll find my offices. <laughs> I have office hours every day, all day, because I'm not allowed to leave. Yeah, it's under the. Books. It's under the sign that says, do we cheat him and how? Like, I got you, dog. It's, it's all good. Um, but yeah, I, 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 with all due respect, sir, I told him, I said, uh, this, re- this search authorization is illegal and immoral because it was served to me after the fact, after the item was searched. And also your order for me to sign it is also illegal and immoral because you know for a fact that you're trying to get me to sign something post like de facto right uh and he looked at me and he got like his face just and like you could see his jaw just clinch up because he thought he this dude thought he was gonna you know just i'm ordering you to sign this private and if i would have signed that that would have been it done they would have taken my clearance and had me out of the army for everything that they were accusing me that i did and this is the investigating officer too this is not a disinterested person for anybody that understands like how military law works he's not a disinterested party this is the investigating officer and so like huge conflict of interest that he's he's asking me to to sign this on behalf of his ncos um that illegally searched my phone and you know after i told him that he just clenched his jaw he looked at me he leans in really close and he goes, you do realize that I'm the commander of the WMD division, right? And I was like, yes, sir, I know who you are. And he goes, you do realize that you have to, even, even if this all goes away and you get back in class and everything that you want comes true, I'm paraphrasing him, but he said something akin to, the, to that. Even if you get back in class, you have to come through my division to get out of here. You do realize that, right? And I was just like, sir, are you threatening me? Yeah, sir, you understand that you just leave me untouchable in your course, right? If right, I come yeah. back, if you do yeah. anything, all I have to do is be like, he's so, punishing me. Oh yeah, yeah, reprisals, right? Well, I'm yeah. way too white and way too heterosexual for that stuff to work. So, but <laughs> nope, <laughs> can't I can't get away with that? Dude. Allegedly heterosexual. Allegedly heterosexual. <laughs> With all my with all okay. my F trophies, I want to I want to give I want to give you credit Sorry. for saying allegedly, okay? But I feel Thank like you. I have to say like that was the wrong usage. So you tried hard, oh, you, mm. you failed. But you know what? I'm I'm excited about it. I'm excited about you trying harder. That's a compliment sh- sandwich, buddy. Continue. Right. Yeah, it's the you, you done good. You're still stupid, but you tried. <laughs> it's the old yeah. So yeah, I'm like, sir, are you are you threatening me? Uh, and he just goes. I think we have an understanding is, is basically what he said. Like you, you, you understand what I'm saying. And I'm like, it was two days after that. I came down on orders to PCS and they removed me from the schoolhouse and sent me to my next AIT. And I remember standing in formation uh, and receiving my PCS orders. There are dudes that had been out of training for five, six, eight weeks, still waiting on orders. Like, uh, at that time it kind of comes in waves as they have to reclassify and and reassign jobs to people that it'll be like, Oh, this group of people, like you can tell what MOS is, uh, military jobs, like wind up short because it'll be like, Oh, all of these dudes are now going to be MPs. And there'll be like a rash of MP orders, like all at once. It's like, Oh dang. It's it's like watching people like absolutely lose on a game show. You know, it's like, let's spin the wheel of torture. And it's like, Oh, no whammies, no whammies, no whammies. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) foiled again uh and then for whatever reason like i was waiting for for two days after after the uh because it was like the investigation formally kicked off this is the speed of the military i had been uh unallowed like like uh remanded to quarters for 30 30 some days at that point the investigation finally came down an investigating officer was finally assigned 
So they basically iced me for a month plus. And then that day is when he realized that, oh boy, we have a big problem on, on the way that this was handled in the beginning, brought me in, tried to get me, uh, you know, to sign the illegal search authorization. And then when I said, no, it was two days later, I had orders taking me to Goodfellow Air Force Base to be a 35 November, an intelligence analyst, signals intelligence analyst. And everybody at the schoolhouse was looking at me. And it was like, even my platoon sergeant was super confused. He was like, how did you get orders so fast? I have never seen somebody get orders that quickly out of here. And I'm like, it's almost like there was a motivation to remove you from that entire scenario so that you didn't do anything like crazy, like, you know, talk about it or share your story or I don't know, get some better input. Yeah, right. If I was smart back then, I would have, I should have gone straight to the press, dude. Just, I'll, I'm well, I'll tell you what, man. Down, dude. <laughs> I'll tell you, like, you know, social media is toxic and terrible and we all hate it, right? But I'll tell you what, if you, you know, take, take, uh, you know, a 13 year trip back in time, if you had like Terminal CWO or, you know, Chaplain yeah. America or some of these other people to, to get your story out there, man, you exactly. Like, this thing would blow up. So at least we have accountability for that. So, and, so and this, is, this is the first time I've ever actually shared this story in the open, right? That like not around campfire. So this is the first right. time it's going out on media. I mean, nobody's going to hear this one anyway, because I've said gay and retard too many times. But so I, I guess another one still, here. I'll mark it. I guess I got I got six clips. <laughs> <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's fine. We're gonna, <laughs> but there's going to be a lot of clown horns. Wait, so you, got, yeah. you were under investigation for allegedly security violations. Correct. And they sent you to go be Intel signals. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. you picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, my, yeah. and my security, uh, clearance was suspended, which was a thing that I didn't realize until I was getting ready to graduate the Intel school six months later, because that <laughs> they, this could, is how they long... couldn't give you orders because your J pass was suspended. <laughs> so they, and that's, and that's when they found out, that's when they found <laughs> out. And, uh, I got no, pulled tight. back. I got pulled back into my commander's office six months later after going through the entire course. I'm graduated. I'm, I'm waiting. Like we're doing the graduation rehearsals and I get called out of, yeah, get called out of, out of rehearsals to go see Captain Dwyer is another dude that I have to shout out. Captain Kevin Dwyer. He's probably not in the military anymore, but this is another red letter, uh, point in my military career because this dude, did the right thing by a private first class that he didn't owe anything to. But he calls me into his office and he's like, by the way, your J pass is suspended. We can't cut you orders to, you know, you, you can't get into a skiff. Sorry. Technically it's been illegal that you've been in our skiff. This is <laughs> at least right. six so, months. So a couple of problems here. So we found out <laughs> that we can't allow you into these spaces at the next place, which brings up kind of like a weird thing. Cause for the last yeah. 180 days, you've been accessing open storage information. Cause that's where we all store it inside of the skiff. You can so the PCS from your last place. Like, how did you get here? <laughs> you were such I had a to problem call... child. What is your problem? Well, and what's funny too, is I PCS from Eglin air force base to Goodfellow air force base. And because I got those orders, they cut me orders in 48 hours. And then the orders gave me 72 hours to report. Oh, tight. Get in the car, get on your bike with, with late reporting unauthorized. So basically I had to call my father. Like this was like a whole thing, man. Like they really upended my life. I had to call my father to come down and I'm like, dad, I've got to be in Texas in three days. I've got a, a pregnant wife. Uh, like I, I can't, I, I can't move that fast. And my dad, who is my absolute best friend to this day said, son, you go do what you got to do. I will take care of your family. I'll make sure that they arrive. And so like I had to, you know, run into, to good fellow, uh, was not going to play the barracks team again. So basically I got there, I walked in, saw my platoon sergeant. I'm like, I, I know the regulations. I'm going to be here for longer than 180 days. I'm living off post. Uh, I basically went, checked out an apartment, put down the deposit and everything that first day that I got there. As I was like, I was doing the whole, like, you know, a stack of pizza boxes thing for my nightstand, you know, for a while as I was waiting on my dad to get my wife over there. Um, Anyway, that's that's the whole PCS story, which I kind of skipped over. But yeah, I was a, I was a sad puppy there for a little bit. But uh, Captain Kevin Dwyer, so he he's looking at me and he's like, you know, we we can't cut you orders. You're under an investigation. They're they're going to pull your clearance, which is already suspended. And so I was like, sir, I was okay, like, well, this. At least it's getting better, you know. Then you don't have to worry about that clearance anymore. The pesky clearance, dude. That, that pesky re TSSCI. My, reserting my clearance every five years is just one of those like. Ah, oh, like bees uh, in my bonnet, you know. It's like what, a real... One of life's great joys is when you just let that thing go and fly away forever. 
Oh, it's, I bet. Uh, yeah. It's really freeing. I'm really looking forward to like getting that DD214. It's like I don't have to research my language now every year. I don't have to research my med credentials now every year. I don't have to research my TS clearance every year. You look at all just the recertifications that I have to do alone. And it's like, this is just getting out of hand, boys. Like, <clears throat> anyway, I'm sorry, Dwyer. No, no, you're good. Yeah, so Captain Kevin Dwyer. Uh, and he goes, you know, I tell him the whole story. I was like, sir, this is, this is a, a made-up, like, allegation. I used it correctly there. Uh, good job. In the, Probably. Yeah, in the objective form too. That's good. And I, I told him the whole story uh, and he just sits there quietly and he's listening to me. Uh, made it all the way through the PCS process, how I got to be in his company and everything. And he looked at me and he goes, Private Hambrock, I am going to look into this and if everything that you're telling me is correct, he goes, I will make sure that your clearance gets re-adjudicated. And he goes, you will graduate this course and you will move on. And he goes, you will never, you, you won't have to deal with these allegations like harming your career anymore moving forward. And I was like, okay, sir. And he goes, but if I find out that you're lying to me, he goes, I will see you out of the military for this. And I said, sir, I, I have not told you a single thing that, that was a lie. I've been completely forthcoming and, and truthful with you on all of these counts. And I said, and I'm not embellishing a single timeline. And he goes, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about. And I, long story short on that one, uh, he did look into it for me. He talked to the uh, battalion commander at the time, who was an who was an awesome, awesome individual. The battalion CSM, uh, and between the three of them, they went to CAF on my behalf. The uh, what is it? The, I don't remember what CAF stands for. We have too many army acronyms, but it's the place that handles the security clearances uh, for the for the Department of Defense. Uh, and they, they expedited, uh, the re-adjudication of my clearance. I got my clearance. It came back down. I made my graduation timeline. Uh, and I even, uh, won awards, uh, for my time at, uh, Goodfellow, uh, going through the AIT process. So I was, I was one of the top graduates through that program. Uh, and then I went from there out to JBLM to go be an intelligence analyst, uh, for the next three years. So that was, that was my training pipeline, like my welcome to the army. So I showed up as a private first class, having already been in the military for two almost two and a half years at that point where all of the rest of my my peers you know had been in the military for four months six months i also went to a, a cav squadron um so if you if you thought that nah, it's, it's he's winding up for it i can feel it coming <laughs> i can feel the cab that's, joke that's stetsons and spurs everywhere boys so oh, man oh yeah. man i knew it as soon as you said cat scouts i was like here i, I have my finger on the mark button for peaches i'm like <laughs> hey uh listen man 47 52 mark it down allegedly up front we're fine yeah so anyway uh yes yeah, so i showed up there all of my all of my peers had been in the military, you know, for, for six months, eight months at that point, that kind of that class of people moving in. And I've, you know, been there, done that, been here for two and a half years. I even had my first AAM by that point. Right. So I'm walking around with like a little, little four ribbon rack. Cause that was back when you got the, you get the rainbow ribbon for, for joining the military. And then you got the NDSM. Remember that? Remember mm-hmm. that bad boy? It's like, we were at war at the time. And then you get the, uh, the global expeditionary force ribbon mm-hmm. you know so it's yeah. like everybody had three and you're like oh i feel cool and they're like it, it, it was dumb but uh you know then i had one on top of that i had my little aam because i'm like Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> I look at you investigation you mr know? big stepper like, in here yeah eat know. them so, charges like rocky came out with some bling on it what up <laughs> uh and yeah and so then i actually finally got to start my military career right uh after after two and a half years and it was a it was a long slog. It was a long process. Um, but like I said, it was a it was an invaluable education for all of the other things that that I had gotten to experience coming through there. So, I w- you know what? At this point, I wouldn't go back and change a thing because it, it's made me a lot wiser of a person. Like I learned how you to wouldn't? scrap. What a dumb comment. I would have changed all of that. Like you're a better man than I am. I'd have been like, yeah, I, I could have done without, quite I mean, frankly, all of that. Found the personal address of that cadre member. Uh, He's really, yeah well yeah maybe okay uh yeah. quick reminder to everybody out there everybody that's ever wronged you is a real person and has a home address looking at you pfizer moving on <laughs> looking at you fauci <laughs> <laughs> tomato tomato nothing makes me ha- nothing makes me happier than dr fauci crying on the stand about the mean messages wasn't go, that great so sad shut up um well so- and it wasn't it wasn't just him it was that congress 
congresswoman that like queued him up for it. You know, oh, she basically yeah, yeah. asked him like the congressional version of like, why are you so awesome? And then why, like, right, please yeah. t- tell us like, you are the hard science. It's, why has it been t- so tough for you? Yeah. Tell it, tell yeah. us why, why being you is so hard, you know? Well, so that gets us to JBLM. So you're living in, in yep. a beautiful Seattle Tacoma area. That's gorgeous. gorgeous. So you're there yeah. on, you get to start your military career. You get to figure out exactly what it is that you want to do, but you don't stay in that job for very long because no. you decide that you want to do something else. So how'd that work out? Yeah. So it was training the, uh, for two more years. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know the half of it. Here we go. It's, it's actually pretty funny because for the almost 14 years that I've been in the military, I was in training for at least five of those years like out of the, nice <laughs> you know it's just on on training status but anyway uh yeah so it was it was coming through that joint environment that really put a, a bug into me for for wanting to work in the special operations community and i uh, after being in the eod community and serving with the navy dudes and, and getting to work with the air force uh like I was just like man i, I want to go back to the joint environment and like what's the quickest way for me to do that and being out here in JBLM, uh, we have first special forces group that was out here. And at the time, um, LLVI and, uh, STG operations were, were huge. And can you tell us what LLVI and STG operations for people that aren't dragging? Yeah. Yeah. Low level voice intercept and uh SIGINT terminal guidance. Uh, and I can't go like too deep into what those are, but basically you would have, you have people on the ground that have specialized equipment that if, you know, they're listening to unencrypted voice traffic that's going out there because Abu bad guy, you know, they're using Motorola's and, and stuff like that to pass information back and forth. Uh, and so at the time when we were doing that, that fine fix finish mission uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, you would basically have these small three, four man teams that would go out with the cool guys. Uh, and, it, it, you know, the little G.I. Joe guy with the giant. <laughs> radio backpack that no kid wanted to play with ever like that was you right and you're just like i look so incognito and you're like <laughs> you you have a giant antenna on yeah. your chest my man <laughs> yeah yeah and everybody's looking at like hey which one of these guys should shoot hey uh shoot the pudgy one with the big backpack on because he doesn't look like he fits in the rest of the team I was like, also keep that guy and the jtac away from me did yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It never want to be in, in the antenna no. farm. Like that is a How bad place to find you yourself. See the, anytime you see the controller throw out the huge whip antenna, you're just like, all right, hey, I'm going to go pull security over here. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be on the radio. I'll be on. I'll be on fires if you need me. I'm out of here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like pacing out 300 meters. You're like, what are yeah. you doing? A, Don't yeah, worry about it. Dude. 300 meters. That's a, that's danger close for stuff that guy, right? Okay. Tight. Yeah. Indirect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I reached out to uh, to first group at the time because I was doing LLVI and SCG operations uh, inside of two uh, two ID. Like that that was again. This is just like one of those God things. All of my buddies graduate uh, the thirty five November course, the SIGINT analyst course, and they all go to like NSA site in Texas, the NSA site in Hawaii, uh, like all of those places. They're spending their entire time in skiffs, never seeing the light of day. And I go to one of the only, uh, like operational line unit, uh, Micos, uh, military intelligence companies that actually requires 35 Novembers to be a tactical frontline 35 November. So it's just another one of those spots where it's just like, dude, I just happened to wind up doing this job, working with the Cav squadron and just, you know, walking through a blizzard of dicks every day, you know, but it was, it was worth it. Uh, and I was like, dude, this is, this is pretty awesome. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to get across the fence to, uh, to go work with the, with the special forces guys. And I happened to go to chapel, um, with one of the officers that worked in the intelligence section in the S2 over in, in first group. And so, you know, chatting with that guy on Sunday afternoons, I'm like, man, I'm really trying to come over and work with you guys. Like I'm already, uh, I had missed a deployment to Afghanistan while I was over there. Like I was basically doing everything that I could do to get up and out of the Myco and like go do the job. Right. It's like, I've been here for two and a half years. Like I want my, I want my deployment patch just like every, every young guy in the military at that time sure. had, had the same attitude. And it was just like, you know, like I, you don't, you don't, spend your whole life training like you want to get in the game and i was trying to get in the game you know so anything that i could do i had talked with one of my friends about uh doing like a one-for-one swap and going over to um the uh, military expedition 
what is it the emib or whatever which i it, it the basically like a plug and play battalion's intelligence asset and then they were going to afghanistan uh and so i was like dude let me let me go do that and they were like well we actually have a guy that's non-deployable like we'll one for one swap you and i was like cool so commanders touch tips they started talking about it my commander comes down and he's like sorry chris can't let you go like i'm not going to give up my you know uh, your single body. asset right yeah you know for a broke body like, so, I, I know i tell you every day that i hate you but now that you're trying to leave me right you. you cannot leave yeah. the organization and it's like oh, a it's, blessing in disguise right like you were one you're like oh finally i get to go to a unit that actually needs me to provide this right. tactical function that's awesome and then six months later you're like i'm trying to go away and they're like sorry man you're the guy that provides the tactical function here at the unit and you're like ah i suck again what did, what did they what did they call it during covid like you're a uh unvaccinated oh, piece of shit what do you uh what is it uh, the, well the there was that we had to have it work if you work yeah, at amazon or, or walmart oh, yeah, essential, yeah. Personnel. Essential, essential personnel essential yeah. personnel and, right. and, and since you're in jbln the essential personnel works at the weed stop and the uh the abc stores that was always that was the craziest thing about that they were like and the, all and trent was making a joke but the amazon distribution center they yeah, never shut 100%. down no didn't even it think was, about it. yeah <laughs> yeah so so yeah, so my commander shut that down. I wasn't wasn't able to go on that. So I missed that deployment. And at this point, I'm just like, dude, get me out of here. Like put me in the game coach. I'm trying to like to finagle any way that I can uh, to to go out the door and do some stuff. Ended up going to uh, National Training Center, doing a rotation there, which I, I saw the uh, SF dudes. I think it was a seventh group team at the time was working like across the fence doing like just real cool guy stuff. And so like, wow, we're trapped at the uh, what do they call it down there? The Ruba. Or whatever. I mean, you guys have ever cool been to stuff in Spanish too, which makes it even better. There's like yeah. some brown <laughs> it, it's, it, it's hombre fresco. Very yeah, cool. Guys. The Pacha Villa I, mustaches. Well, you were coke. like, you were like, like, hey, it's seventh group. They were doing really cool stuff. I was like, what? Like Coke? Like normal? Yeah, or? exactly. <laughs> the joke, yeah, but it wasn't the organized. You know that, right? Like, hey, what? Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. The, the jokes write themselves. But it was cool, man. So it's like, well, we are, we're trapped behind the fence eating MREs and just, you know, feeling generally shitty about our, our, our situations like you see these guys like they can go out on base like they got the they got their rental cars like they're going and getting pizza drinking beer every night and i was like that how do i go do that right. you know That's the so, move. Like, i don't know what i gotta do but i don't want to do this i want to do that right and you know it's really funny too because it's like in in special operations i don't know if they do this to you guys over on the air force side of the fence but it, there there are some dudes that get a hair in sideways about like uniform standards and we we have uniform nazis in sf just like any other organization does but i'm like i've never talked to a dude that didn't have an experience like that whether it was on the civilian side watching like the movie and seeing the cool guys or being in the military and having that like i i know a dude that tells a story about being on an airfield in Afghanistan and seeing uh, an SF dude walk off of the back of a C-130 with a box of pizzas. And then just walks over and he goes, Hey, you guys, it was like, he was an MP at the time. And he's like, Hey, you guys want to want a pizza? And they, cause they flew pizzas into, into Afghanistan Love and, it. He, and same. And That's he was a big like, move. That's a big and, move. Right. And he was like, what do you do? I want to do that. Right. And it, it ended up being a, a third group dude. <clears throat> I'm a pizza guy. Yeah. I mean, what you guys don't have pizza here, right? At the at the Green Beans, what are you talking about? What are you guys pizza? talking about? Yeah, this is this is before the boardwalk got set up at CAF too. You know, oh my so. god, that thing was just the most <laughs> ridiculous. Like I remember, we I, I was never stationed at CAF because by the time that I went back to Afghanistan, I, I went there a couple times. And by the time I yeah. went back in 2015, we'd shut CAF down and we didn't have. They they ended up opening it back up for rescue at one point too. Like there was this mm. weird time where they had some teams there and then they took them away. Yada yada. There was nothing more absolutely jarring than watching Bagram. Like we, we dropped like 8,000 personnel during my time at Bagram. Like everything was like shutting down. We were flushing a whole lot of people out. Dude, they and were dropping, like, they were dropping personnel every time they flew out of Bagram there at the end. That is a fantastic joke. That is a fantastic joke. Well done to you. You know, you know who I'm talking about. I, <laughs> you screwed, you screwed that literally. pooch so badly. Uh, and we will but, never, we yeah. will never forgive you for that. No, sir. No forgiveness, no quarter, no forgetting. But uh, we, hey. sorry, yeah, we uh, dude, like seeing that boardwalk at Catholic, uh, like I literally like looked at it and I was like on a different mm. planet. I was like, dude, we, we yeah. just got shot at on the way in here. And you're telling me there's a TGA Fridays and I can get exactly. ice cream. Like get the, TGA what, are we, Friday. what are we doing? Like, this isn't what we're and supposed the, to. And the food quality was like, just we as do? shitty as every TGA Fridays you've ever every, seen. Every, yeah. It was, but hey. First of all, don't you say shitty. TGI Fridays is amazingly <laughs> consistent, even in Afghanistan. Consistent, same level. You never went as, to the TGI Fridays in Fayetteville, then. 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Oh, dude, come for the jalapeno popper. Stay for the dude getting popped in the in the parking lot after. That was TGI Fridays in Fayetteville. Nice. Bro. So, oh my God, where was I? Uh, we were talking so, about yeah, NTC. Being, an, being enamored. Yeah, being enamored by special forces dudes and wanting to be just like true. them. True, that's true. I still want to be just like them, man. Those special forces guys are so cool. Every so, day. Every day, dude. So, I was working with the, the officer, the S2 officer, uh, at church about trying to get over there and he was like well you know what if you bring me uh your erb next week like your military resume and he goes i'll walk it over i'll, I'll give it to the the group support battalions sergeant major who's a green beret and he goes if he likes what he sees you know like we'll we'll just pull you over he's like it's a 4187 and i was like oh this is awesome i finally finally gonna be something dad and uh send him my send him my erb and the dude was like you know, the next week at church, he was, he's like, you look awesome, man. We want to bring you over. He's like, we'll pull you right into the GSB. He goes, the only thing that my Sergeant Major is concerned about is that you're not airborne qualified. Um, and that's, this is hilarious today because we have people in, in my unit, especially support people that are not airborne qualified. And it, it is so funny to me, my story versus seeing what the military is doing now, because there's only one thing that stands between you and literally doing anything in the military. And that's a high enough general level officer signature. Yep. That's all it takes. Like the military is not a democracy. There's no legislation that needs to be passed. It is at, you just find the guy with enough rank on his chest and slide him something with a letterhead on it. And he signs it. And then you can go do it right. Like that, that's it. But at the time, like, no, you're not airborne qualified. Uh, if you can go to airborne school, then we'll, we'll pull you over gladly. You would just need you to have that papa identifier. And I'm like, oh my God, back at square one. So I go to my unit and they were running a uh, a competition at the time that if you won this competition, then you would go to Ranger School. And so I did me some scheming and I'm like, if I could just get down to Fort Benning, I'm like, I can probably find a way to stay there and then go from ranger school and walk over across the street, walk on to airborne school. That was my plan. It didn't end up going according to plan. Uh, I was there well, for- Well, because you have to be airborne qualified to go through ranger school, do you not? Is there not like a mass no, attack you, jump? No, you, no, you no, do really? not. No, there, oh, there wow. is. Oh, wow. I have that backwards. So, yeah. So uh, it's just, if you're not airborne qualified, they just call you the G word. A and dirty, you, nasty leg? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, dirty, nasty leg. There and we then, go. And uh, then you, you basically become the, the, the DZ bitches while oh, they're doing tight. the jumps. And so they put I mean, you I don't on know the why edges I always, of the DZ. I, I always assumed you'd have to get airborne before you went to that. I'm glad you corrected me. I was wrong. No, it's just and, like and, being an attack D around free fall, guys. Like, that's all it is. That's... <laughs> A dry, a dry boy around the divers. Yeah. Just like, just I'll, the, I'll be in the boat while you're all being eaten by sharks. Let me know. You know you what? Mean. Everybody it was a good <laughs> run. So signing off from the ones ready podcast. I'd just like to say, thanks for sticking with us for 350 episodes, but what did uh, I we're camping that time. A dry guy yeah. around dive bubbles. <laughs> That's Moving me. On. That's it was Trent this time. Even oh. it's some, sometimes it's even your own homies. You know what I mean? Like everybody's catching strays and you got to make it a thing. Like it's one tack P joke. So like, I have years of just supporting these dudes. All right, jeez. Told you, man. I infect everybody. It's just by being in in close proximity. It's like COVID all, right. all over again. Yeah. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah. You weasel yourself down to Benning. I did, yeah. And uh, I was there for uh, almost five months. Uh, I went through Mountain Phase twice. Uh, was ten days out from graduation. Got injured. Came home from Ranger School. Ended up not tabbing out. And then because I didn't get my Ranger tab, my plan of like staying on and walking over to Airborne School didn't work out. Uh, and another of the failures that I'm, that I'm glad now that I went through at the time, I was, I was bitter about not getting my Ranger tab for a, for a very long time, but I'm glad now because after going through that experience, like I said, like it warmed me up to the whole selection process, how to do that. Like the, at, at no point in the Q course, uh, did I ever go through anything that was worse than what I went through in Ranger school? Nice. And in fact, I, rem- I remember that a reach back moment in the business. Yeah, I, I remember seeing some of my, my homies, like, especially in like SUT and stuff being out there and we're just getting dumped on, rained on. And they just, they got the, the sad puppy dog faces and they look at me and, and they're like, why? Like, I don't understand. You know, it's like, I'm still laughing, joking. Like, this is pretty much my personality as long as I don't get pissed off most of the time. And they're like, I don't get it, man. Like, and I'm like, dude, this ain't, this ain't Mount Greasy at Rangers. Bay, hey, trust me. Like, right. it's not can't, that bad. <laughs> it can get a get whole out of it. lot Might worse. as well get into it, homie. Might as well have be excited ever, about it. Have you ever heard of freezing fog? 
because <laughs> that's a thing and i've lived through it yeah <laughs> about weather no? okay. oh god oh my god oh, no. no oh jeez oh my god i thought cat scouts were bad we're gonna talk weather forecasting tell me about ice fog trend how dangerous it is wow Oh, it's goodness. definitely going to be sunny for this battle today, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm That's special operations, yeah. too. <laughs> oh, yeah, weather boy. Uh, my wife, when she first saw that video, she woke me up so she could laugh in my face. That was a, it was a good one, man. That was back when when uh, when Matt when was funny. really funny. Yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> nice. Sorry. Make funny stuff again, guys. I'm Jesus. trying to get laughed at for wearing my BRC t-shirts. Be cool again. Are, I'm so glad that I lied to you guys about hitting record on this so that we can just forget that this episode ever happened. Okay. Trent, is there anybody else you want to make fun of that are our friends that is going to get us in trouble? Chris, you got any slurs you want to drop? Like, God, I'm trying, guys. Is it a free fire zone right now? Are no, it is not. It is not. It is absolutely not. Could you just tell the fucking story about getting into being an 18 Delta? Why did you want to be an 18 Delta? So you, you kind of like breezed over the fact that you decided to apply for and then actually go to selection. Yeah. Um, so it all goes back to, to getting, trying to get out of the, out of the CAV unit and make my way over to first group. Cause I originally wanted to just be Intel for them. I was fine with what I was doing with Intel. I was enjoying the LVI and the SDG operations and, and everything with copacetic, but I could not get to airborne stool. So that's where I was like, you know what? And I just walked my happy ass over and started talking to the special operations recruiting guys. Yep. And walked in and. Uh, it's it's funny to admit now, but I was too much of a bitch at the time to double down and go straight to SFAS. I I, I had watched the two weeks in hell just like everybody else. Sure, I was like right. that shit looks terrible. Don't want to do it. Uh, but it's like I but my the bug had bit me so bad. And I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to go to special operations. I walked over and the CA guy got a hold of me. Right, the whole recruiting uh gig all over again. And he was like, it where he got me. Was he was like, dude, I can promise you right now to send you to Sockham. And it's the same Sockham that the 18 Deltas go through. We all go through the same course. Uh, and he was like, you will go straight to there. He was like, this is what CA selection looks like at the time. I think it was uh, just about two weeks. Two weeks sounds right. Um, <clears throat> well, goes, that's, well, yeah, so, that's all it is. It's what? Thank, thanks, Trent. I actually have a valid input. Uh, CA is civil affairs, everybody that's this, not tracking. This is true. Yeah. Uh, High level <laughs> operators. Start start the uh, SF light jokes, you know. <laughs> Jesus, Christ. so much so, which is really funny because the very first CA battalion was was stood up by all tabbed dudes when they started. They were all eighteen series guys that stood up the first one, and then eventually it it migrated off to be its own specialty I- entirely. Um, don't ask me what they do because I went through the course, graduated, and I still don't know. Uh, but we talk to people, go to the embassy parties. It's it's a great gig. Uh, if you ever find yourself wearing a rucksack, sleeping outside or carrying something heavy, like you're doing CA wrong. It's a, it's a good life. Like whatever, man, it was, it was fun. I, I actually really enjoyed my time in CA, but they got me with the promise of going to Sockham. So I went to the selection past the CA selection, um, because being a medic, like I felt like I was going back to, to my original calling. I originally wanted to join the military to be a medic. Now I have another opportunity uh, to go to the, the military's like premier medical course. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I was like, dude, that is what I want to do. I love medicine. I love the idea of being a medic. Um, and so that, that's, that's what I decided to do. <clears throat> uh, went and I passed the, the CA selection. First time go, no problems. Went straight through the CA course, no problems. Went to... Uh, the Sockham course, which is, which is nine months. Uh, so this is the other callback why I talked about my time in EOD paying dividends, because if I thought EOD school was hard and the right. amount of information that you have to go through is hard, Sockham, uh, the special operations combat medics course is the fastest paced academic program, uh, probably in the department of defense easily. Uh, and I mean, it we, is, we go from that to paramedic and ATP in, you know, seven months. But what I mean, yeah, it's probably pretty good. Oh, okay. Yeah, MBD, MBD. But, uh, by the way, you, just for everybody out there, <laughs> oh, that the was a joke. <laughs> PJ, Jesus Christ. PJs don't go through Sockham. We haven't since like the early 2000s or late 99. It's for a bunch Something of different like that, reasons. Yeah. We get nationally registered paramedic. I wasn't de- degrading Sockham. I don't need 75 ranger medics in my comments talking about, you guys they're don't the, even go through field medicine. They're the, they're the worst. First of all, shut up, private. 
you know, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Ranger Christ. medics. <laughs> okay. No, well. I no, I love no, I love you guys. Ranger medics are uh, when it comes to trauma, like afterwards after sock comes over. Uh, Ranger medics are the primos. Like I would take a Ranger medic over an eighteen Delta when it comes to like point of 100%. injury care. Yeah. Anytime, love you guys. Like yeah. again, it's a joke. If I can take it, like come on, dude. It's somebody out there cannot take it. It's we're fine. gonna get some fifteen year old that runs an army meme page. Uh, that's, that's like, what well, it is. Uh, you know, first of all, you guys don't understand the complexities of indigenous <laughs> medicine. Yeah, actually, Man, like actually, shut, shut up, up neck, dude. dude. Yeah, how how heavy is that airsoft gun, bro? Like seriously. Also, stop buying up all the cry stuff because it's like my waitlist time for the pouches that I ordered. Because <laughs> I got some in the garage if you want to buy some. I got <laughs> oh yeah, left over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just give it to you. Like, oh, I got stuff in plastic in a shelf. Oh, oh, all right. Here comes all the jokes about how Sorry. much money you guys have. Oh yeah, there's poor I people around. Don't, dude. Yeah, the pores. You're like cry. That's that's cool. Have you ever heard of that? You mm. see this little like lizard skeleton I got Ooh, right here. Geez. This little Ooh, this dead, bir- this little yeah. dead bird gang. Jeez. <laughs> oh, um, the coat is so warm and comfortable. It is. <laughs> we, we like to cry. Jeez, yeah. I, right. Oh man. <laughs> you know what? I I always ask people that are like ordering cry. I'm like, hey, can I borrow whatever time machine it is you have to take you back to when that shit was cool? No. All right. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so you, you you get through the entire CA pipeline. You decide you yep. want to go to over to, to first. Uh, yeah. So I went to, <laughs> it got me good, man. Um, I got assigned Chinese as a language because CA has to get a language too. So coming out of the CA pipeline and going to, I went to language school for, when I was there, language school was the very first stop you did. So the very first six months language school, learn Chinese, CA course for, for four months, came out of that straight to Sockham, Sockham for nine months. When I got done with that, nearly two year pipeline, I was like brain scrambled. And it was hilarious because I would be having some beers on like a Friday night and my wife would always look over at me and like there would be like a certain point where it's like I would start like popping off with Chinese stuff and she'd be like, as soon as you do that, you're cut off. You're yeah. as soon as you start speaking Chinese, you are cut off. Like no no good. Uh I kind of do was, that too if I get too tuned up, but I'm just the difference with me is I don't know any Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> He just speak like this all the time. All right. So, <laughs> it's not, oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god, that's not that's not that's not even Chinese. Okay, I did all it. Right. I did it. All right, oh my. all right. Break in the chat. So, got through that, and I went to the ninety seventh Civil Affairs Battalion. Uh, I was there for about five months. The ninety sixth was deployed to Syria at the time. They had a medic get injured. Uh, the way that the dwell time was working for us at the time as we were on a two to one mm-hmm. uh, and basically none of the medics. And so over there it's, it's four man teams. They're called cats. Meow. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was cat six, one, two at the time their medic got injured. None of the rest of the medics uh, in their company or in their battalion could break off of cycle to go. Cause they're the, the middle East centric battalion. Uh, so they reached out to us. Uh, the 97th was the uh, PACOM. Aligned battalion. Uh, and my first sergeant called me in the office. Um, it was a, a Tuesday after a four day weekend. We were doing like motor pull stuff, checking on the vehicles and whatnot. He calls me in and he goes, Hey, man, I know you've been talking about wanting to get in the game. Like, I, I came in there like a super motivated young staff sergeant just looking for all the opportunities to get out the door. And it definitely went very noticed. And uh, my first sergeant at the time was just like, Hey, man, I got an opportunity. 96 needs a medic. Uh, do you want to go downrange to Syria? He's like, it's going to be almost four months. They're midway through a six month tour. And I was like, absolutely. And he goes, okay, the correct answer is I need to go call my wife and then come back in here. And I was like, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go call. <laughs> I'll go call my wife. So I did. I stepped outside and uh, if she, if she's going to hear this, she might as well know. I, I did the old, uh, babe, I'm sorry. I'm getting sent to Syria. <laughs> like I just, I just found out. <laughs> None you. of us have ever done that before. None <laughs> of us, babe, listen, I didn't have any chance, man. I didn't follow. They just told me it's they the it's an order. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know what an order is? Like they're telling me I have to go. Yeah, exactly. So uh hey, you ladies keep talking. I'll be right back. Sounds good. So yeah. that's what I did. And he was like, Cool. Uh you gotta be on the ground. Uh not it was a Tuesday, so not this Friday, but next Friday. And I was like, oh, Yeah, easy. Roger that, yeah. Uh, which like looking back now, you know, it's like, I've actually deployed on shorter notice, but yep. at the time I was just like, and, uh, I went and I talked to the rear D dude, uh, over in the 96. Cause I also had to like transfer battalions and everything. And it's like, oh, I'm sure with, yeah, I'm sure with your guys's 
units, you kind of experience this too, where it's like uh, each each unit kind of like has its micro personality and everything, mm-hmm. and you kind of you kind of get into that groove. And I had only been there for five months, but I was just kind of getting into the way that ninety seventh works. And um, <laughs> if you think first group is weird. With all of the with all of the trips to Asia, civil affairs is like, I mean, because that that's where they're going too. But it's like when they when they deploy to Asia, like they're just basically hanging out with the with the Pat, hanging out Wait, with the with the embassy immersive. teams. Like, it's a weird contest, and they're winning. Yeah, like when I'm just gonna say it, guys, you're gonna get mad at me, but it's it, this is also a great recruiting tool. If you want to go on six month vacations to like Bangkok, Thailand. And just hang out. You want to be in civil affairs, like it, it's a it's a great life if that's what you're if that's what you're after. <clears throat> but yeah, man, I just I really wanted I really wanted to uh, to get my my Middle East hop while I was in. You know, I hadn't felt like I got to go to the game, the whole uh, non permissive environment or sorry permissive environment like like Asia thing at the time for me just wasn't as interesting. I wanted my combat patch. I was. I was young, I was hungry, I was naive. Like all that stuff because we, we're all there at some point. Yeah. Um now I'm like, dude, I love hanging out in Thailand <laughs> with <laughs> first group. This is great. You got to scratch the itch. Everybody has right, the itch. But I've also I've also got my trips to the sandbox under my belt. So been yeah. there, done that. It's kind of easy for me to say now that it's not a big deal cuz there's going to be people coming up behind us that are, you know, it's you got to do your thing and go scratch your itch too, right? But uh been there, done that. <clears throat> so I jumped out the door, went to Syria uh, for four months with uh, Cat Six One Two. I am still to this day one of the best teams that I've ever been on. I still talk to my CA and COs uh, that I served with over there. Talk to my team leader every once in a while. Uh, the, they were an awesome, awesome group of dudes. One guy is a uh, Chinook pilot now. Uh, the team leader, I think he's out of the military. He got his MBA. Uh, he's working for like a Fortune Five Hundred, just doing awesome for himself. Uh, and each one of them, like they, we've all gone on to do great things. It was an awesome team to be a part of. And at the time I got deployed down to the flot and I didn't realize what was going on. Cause again, paycom aligned battalion, transfer battalion, centcom. I get on the ground. Uh, they fly me in on the ring rotator. I deploy by myself, uh, with, with my narcs case. The only thing that I took with me was my drugs. Cause they wouldn't transfer drugs between medics in country for whatever reason. Cause looking back now, it's like, it's a 2062 doc. Okay. You, you almost got me sent to an Iraqi prison, you prick. But anyway, <laughs> so it's like I landed, I landed on the ground and like an idiot baby medic, you know, the Iraqi uh, TSA was just like, you know, do you have anything to declare? And I was like, yes, I have these drugs. And the guy looks at me, tells me to open it up, sees a case full of narcotics. And then they're just like, you know, he waves another dude comes over. I had just gotten back from Sear school. Uh, oh, five no. five this weeks before this deployment. This isn't good. So I was like, oh, <laughs> oh no, in, I'm in danger. <laughs> I'm in danger. Yeah. Anytime that somebody, oh, anytime that my, somebody waves somebody over, it's like, yeah. In some language that you don't understand, telling them come over here and look yeah. at this, you know it ain't going to be good. So That's not going my, anywhere. My good. butthole is in my throat, and I'm like looking at these guys, and I'm <laughs> showing them my paperwork, uh, and I hear them going back and forth in uh, in uh, Arabic. Um, or Levantine or whatever they were speaking. And again, you know, Chinese linguist. So I don't know what's going on, but I hear him pop off with Ruski like a couple of times. And I was like, negative ghost rider. Like I pull out of my backpack, my little American flag. I was like a Medici. It was like the only word that I knew in Arabic. I was like a Medici, a Medici. And I was like pointing at the military, you know, army stamp on my documents. I'm like this. And then while these guys are talking, um, <clears throat> the one dude tries to take my case from me. I put my hand on top of the case, situation's escalating, and now they're irritated with me. I'm texting with my other hand, my contact that's supposed to be meeting me in the airport. And he's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in customs around the corner from the baggage claim. They're getting, they're trying to take me into a side room. And he goes, don't go with them anywhere. I'm two minutes out. So I basically have to stand there, try not to get 120 seconds, dude. You just got to figure it out. You, you, well, yeah, you and got it was- 120 seconds for the rest <laughs> of your life, big guy. <laughs> dude. And uh, so eventually he comes around the corner. He sees me, walks up, boom, like here's here's his CAC. I was showing them my military ID with my little flag patch and whatever. They get real angry now that there's two of us Americans. He like scoops me up, uh, grab my drug case. I'm like, close it. I'm like, thank you. Uh, it's just over it in my backpack and we're out the door uh, and get, you know, they put me on the rotator and, and fly me into country because that was uh, that was in Erbil, Iraq. And so I still had to jump from Erbil and, and fly into Syria. 
so two days later, I hit the ground with my team. And my team leader, <laughs> he meets me. <clears throat> he meets me at the FOB, and we have to drive from there out to the outstation where we were located, like down on the river. Like I could see the Euphrates River from my team house, which is which is pretty cool, birthplace of civilization. Yeah, not, and, not a bad uh, spot to be. No, nah, well, I mean, it was a, a very bad spot to be actually well, out yeah. of the flat, but it was it was Wah. pretty cool. Well, I get, this guy can't find the silver lining in anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> You've been asking for this for three yeah. years, and now you're complaining <laughs> about it. Now you're complaining about it. Yeah. 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 As soon as he gets there, he's like, "Oh no, oh no, I don't. Mm. Oh no, what is? Oh, what is this? Are they? Oh, are they shooting about? at us? Boy, these people are very angry. It seems. Every NCO that's been what? there told you about this, and you wanted you to go seen... anyway. And now you're here complaining. Have you ever seen that comic where it says the last Arab on Earth, and it's a dude laying on his back, and he's got a sword in his hand and a sword in his foot, and he's like fighting himself? Like, <laughs> you never seen that one. We had it on the wall of my team house, so <laughs> they're always angry about something, man. I don't understand. Um, but anyway, I do. It's a joke, guys. Get over it. So, <laughs> so that's where I was for uh, for four months. And uh, while we were there, we we basically got shot at uh, damn near constantly. We went through like a two week period where it was like we were getting uh, IDF like every day yeah. um and then as soon as the uh clouds came over uh, i was there from july <clears throat> through the end of october early november and like as soon as the cloud cover came in and isr got knocked out then it just ramped up from there because yeah. it was like drones can't see so uh so yeah i got to i got to get my war on uh i i got to do all the medic things while i was there worked with the uh the air force uh, spe- special operations surgical team the saucy dudes nice awesome awesome unit i actually worked with the dude if you've seen the recruiting video there's the the nurse that's in there and he's got like the fabio hair and like the perfect oh, yeah. skin complexion oh, he yeah. was the he was the dude on the team that i worked with he's actually nice. an awesome yeah he was an awesome dude i I, so, well, I i think it's the exact same dude but that guy support we had a, a large pre-deployment uh thing that we did and that team supported us too so we've had yeah. emily opfer on before but that was the same team those guys are awesome. oh cool shout out, yeah. shout out to them shaman boys yeah, they're they're awesome dudes, man. And uh so I got to do <clears throat> basically all the medic stuff uh on my first trip. So I mean Crikes, uh we did uh some battlefield surgery. I had to help the help the surgeons do some uh some traumatic amputations, um chest tubes. Like we we did it all, man. Uh ended up treating a couple of uh United States Marines that were on our sec four. Uh, at the time they got some shrapnel injuries, like medivac those dudes out. So it really in a short period of time, um, I went from being not just the new guy in CA, brand new guy on the ground in Syria with 96 civil affairs battalion, right. Uh, to being basically the most, having the most like battlefield medical experience in the span of about five weeks. Right. Uh, and like every time that we would drive back up to, to our, our Ron site to go like refit and do, and, and do whatever, I couldn't figure out why the other medics in the battalion who I, you know, who I just met were all like giving me kind of the cold shoulder. Like they were, they were kind of slow to, it's like, you know, it just, they weren't like, I'm not going to say, you know, mean, you know, they, they weren't being like dicks, but it was just like, man, I'm not like feeling the love, you know, there's not like a, like a real warm sense of camaraderie. And it was, it was one of the other medics that took me aside and was finally like, you got to understand, like you've done more medicine in two weeks than any of us have done in the entire time that we've been in this job. Everybody hates a mission magnet. They hate them for two reasons. Number one, you're getting to do the job and they want to do the job. And then number two, yeah. they, they also know that you're bad luck because every time you show yes. up, something bad happens. Yes. And that is, that has been ever since I've come over to the special operations side of the fence, I am the, the lightning rod. Like wherever I go, just bad shit starts to pop off around no me. Thanks. It's, it's, it's been hilarious. My, I mean, my but, good friend. But I always come out. I always come out of it on the other side, like unscathed, like somehow. My good friend <laughs> Dan is like that. Dan was a prior enlisted guy that I went through the pipeline with. He's a crow now that works up in Alaska. But Dan would he was hilarious because every single thing, like we would read the news, and it was like you know, pararescue team leader saves four forty Afghan civilians from avalanche, and I was like. Let me guess. And you open it up. Sure. Shit. It's Dan. He made like a recruiting post. He's got the square jaw. Like he made a recruiting poster at one point, but it was just his entire career is just like, how were you there? Like the base attack that happened out in Bastion way back in the day. So I think this had to be like 11 or 12, but the big base attack that they almost killed a 
bunch of people on Bastion and the, the pararescue team was one of the guys that uh, engaged him. Dan was one of the guys that did that. And I turned no, him shit. up. Like I was there like a rotation later, like our, our unit, our sister troop turned that team over. And then I turned our sister troop over, but it was yeah. funny because I'm going through the, the files. I'm reading the AARs and watching the videos because they had everything on video. And it was just one of those things, man, like some guys, it's just, they're a black cloud. Like they're just there mm-hmm. when bad stuff happens and you don't know if they attract it or if they're just there to fix it. Right. But, it's a real chicken in the egg kind of thing. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we wrapped up, wrapped up that deployment, turned over, um, <clears throat> turned over with our sister team. And it was kind of cool. I don't know if you guys have seen the, uh, the free ranger Burma's or free Burma mm-hmm. Rangers documentary of that stuff that they did in Syria. They came in on the team that I turned over with and was, was working with them, uh, which, which is kind of a cool touch point because I ended up helping to, uh, to connect those dudes. They wanted to like, exchange some coins and stuff after the after the military and uh, awesome. it was kind of cool to, to meet those dudes I, I really like what what they're doing that's a pretty cool mission but uh came back tried to stay in the 96th because i liked what i was doing uh really wanted to go to go back and be on the mission again i hadn't gotten enough at that point uh, i talked to the sergeant major at the time he was like you know uh we love having having you on the team, you know, real go getter, all of that stuff. Uh, he goes, let me talk to the <clears throat> brigade sergeant major and see if I can't keep you here. Uh, at the time, the brigade sergeant major, one of his one of his main points was like getting everybody re language aligned because it, it, you know, it's like a real killjoy when you're in South America and you have a dude that speaks Chinese and then you go to the well. Actually, I was in the Middle East, right, speaking Chinese. I actually, used my language there, which is a funny story at one point, but. Uh, you know, you go, go down to South America and you got a dude that speaks Arabic and you're like, this isn't helping us at all. Like, so that was one of his initiatives. And he was, he was like, absolutely not. Dude needs to go home to the 97th. So I was moving home, uh, and they were expanding the battalions at the time. And so Fox company 97th was getting, was getting stood up all brand new people. And they were pulling the senior most people from across the organization because they were going straight back to Syria five months later. And so as I was coming back in the first sergeant that was standing up the company at the time, scooped me straight up. He was like, you were the only person in this company with one deployment experience and deployment experience to Syria on the mission, uh, that we're going to, you know, so no brainer for him. But this time when I went home and I told Hannah, I basically was on the ground for a week, found out that I was going to Fox company 97th, found out Fox company 97th was going back to Syria. And so I, I had to go home and tell my wife, I'm like, okay, this time it's not a joke. Like I really okay, so like, back to Syria. If I'm like, going back to Syria and I, yeah. that's the time I didn't have a choice. They literally allowed yeah. me, which um, it's really funny to me. And I'm not, I'm not going to shit on these guys, uh, but there's a difference in the mindset of a person that comes into either the military or even a little bit more into the special operations community. Does their one pump? And then goes out and then you see these dudes like on social media or out in the, in the public space, like, hell yeah, brother, I'm going to help you get selected and help you be a special operations warrior. And I know everything about it. Cause I was a 18, whatever, or I was a ranger, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, uh, it was after my second deployment that I came back where I really, really felt like I, I started understanding how to do the job because there's a difference in going one time coming back and being like, that was shitty. And then having the the fortitude, because that was kind of a low point in my life. I remember my my drinking got a little out of control. Like I got a little like depressant, uh, started getting, you know, because it was just like, I, dude, I just about died like 30 times. Yeah. And then it's like, now I've got to go back, you know, yep. straight back to the same spot, which ended up being funny because my second deployment, like, lightning did not strike twice you know like the only situations that we had like they weren't caused by the enemy they were caused because i was there with the whole withdrawal and everything that that trump ordered and so it was just it was just a military circus um and so we got to be a part of that whole process but it's it's the it was for me the process of maturing and figuring out how to lather rinse repeat and then come back and like reintegrate a second time and going through that, like that's where I really felt like I had kind of grown into my own in the special operations community and like became part of the the next generation level up, you know. So <clears throat> yeah, it's 
that, that was an, that was an interesting time. But so I, I went back to, uh, yeah, Fox company 97 going straight back to Syria. Uh, we did our rapid train up deployed. I literally went back to damn near the same bunk that I left. That's the always first, great. The first time. And, uh, I was like, man, I should not have peed on this mattress before I left. Right. Screw you, ISIS. Screw you. <laughs> well, at least like the good thing about that is like, ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The good thing about that is, though, like you don't even need your headlamp at night. If you gotta, if you gotta walk out to go to the bathroom, you know exact, like you know those hallways pretty well. This is true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know how to get to the chow hall pretty quick. You know what I'm saying? So, second deployment, we were there for. We were on the ground for 40 days. Uh, I think in 40 days we did like 20 some missions or something like that. And then the with the withdrawal happens. Uh, everybody, you know, get your asses out of out of Syria. Uh, my one of my buddies, I wasn't, we got, we got on the C-17, uh, and went back to, um, Kuwait. One of my buddies was on that, on that G lock where they basically drove all the way across Syria on that, on that murder convoy. He was, he was on that, which is really funny. They actually gave him a bronze star for that like joker <laughs> for being on that convoy. He was like, dude, he's, he was like, the Iraqi kids were throwing piss bottles at me. I'm like, we do it to them. I'm like, get over it, bro. <laughs> Can't take a little return fire. <laughs> like, oh boy. I never thrown a piss bottle at a kid. No. Well, that's it's good. A, thanks. That's a joke. For, yeah. Thank, yeah. Thanks for putting um, that up. So, so yeah. Uh, and then we were in, we were in Kuwait for 45 days. And then in true military fashion, it was like, all right, good drill. Everybody back into Syria. <laughs> so then we went back in for, uh, 50 some days or whatever it was. And basically we were just the, at that point we were the placeholder for the next CA team that was, that was going to go in there. Uh, and that was the point on that deployment, uh, where I started experiencing the, uh, the circus of special operations and really, uh, seeing the missteps in, in like military planning and how it can like cause second, third order effects. And I was like, you know, this, the CA thing was, was fun for a time. Um, and then, uh, I also came down on the levy on the Swix levy. So I was supposed to come back and be the, uh, what is that? What's the levy? Oh, the, uh, oh, the levy, uh, is the, is the army version of like the marketplace. Um, they, oh, they've like changed the marketplace. Yeah. So, so yeah. you were going to, you were going to fleet up and go to a different position. Got it. Yeah, exactly. And they, uh, I was actually being groomed for a, uh, a team sergeant spot. And to like eventually become a first sergeant. So they were, they were going to send me to be the CA recruiter back to JBLM. And I was like, nah, fam, <laughs> like you got the wrong dude. And nah, dude. Uh, yeah. So I, I had decided, I was like, I like what I'm doing. I like being a team medic, uh, being a medic on a team is like the greatest position ever. Like you're too senior to deal with bullshit, but you're too junior to deal with stuff like the levy. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like I'm cool with being a staff sausage at the time. I'm like, I, I don't need anything more than this. Just leave me on a team, dude. I like what I'm doing. Like also it's not a bad thing for people to not want to get promoted. Sometimes a dude just kills it. I wish they would bring back like the, the specialist ranks. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, you could like spec one, two, three, four, five. Cause it's like, I love what I'm doing and I'm, I'm really good at it and just leave me here. You, you know, know, like I pair rescue. Need- yeah, the pair rescue community, we do that. Like you force people to go like, mm. so there's, there's a difference between a skill position and a leadership position, right? Jump sure. master is a skill position. You have a skill that you're going to do. And yes, you're leading as a jump master and making sure everybody's safe, but that's a skill position. We have leadership positions that are called element leader and team leader. And mm. basically that changes how many people you oversee. Element leader can run two sixties or, or, or a rotor. They call it rotary wing team leader, right? So if you're going to work on a helicopter, you can do the team. And then as you go to a fixed wing team leader, then you could do the whole gamut of stuff to include jumps and jump master and all this other stuff. But it always frustrated me as we would have killer, you know, staff sergeant, tech sergeant, element leader types that can do everything, but they don't want to be a flight chief. They don't want to, they don't want to write EPBs. And when you get to that team leader function, as soon as you're like fully qualified, usually that's like tech sergeant level, like, you know, tech sergeant, you know, master sergeant level for us. So, you know, E6, E7. Um, man, there are people that never want those extra responsibilities. They just want to stay on the team. And I never understood why it is that we hamstrung guys to force them into this leadership position that they don't, that they don't want to do. Um, you know, I think yeah. like when I was growing up, my dad, he ended up being a lieutenant, uh, lieutenant in the small fire service that he worked in. So it was like fireman, lieutenant, and captain, like shift captain and captain. I think were the only four ranks he had, but 
this one good family friend. His name was Bucky. Uh, old Buck Rogers. That was actually his name. No um, joke. Yeah. I know a Buck it, Rogers. It, yeah. We, we called him Bucky. Guy. Yeah. Right. Anyway, but, uh, Bucky never, they, they offered him, he was a fireman at that place. Like exactly as long as my dad was and never wanted to be anything but a fireman. He was like, I don't want to be a Lieutenant. Don't want to be a captain. I want to work on the trucks. Don't want to be a paramedic either. I'm here to fight fire and I'm here to break windows and save cats and all that other stuff. Don't ask me to promote out. I don't understand why there isn't a path for people like that. Cause I can think uh, there's four or five PJs in my head right now that are absolute murder. I wonder if this, there was a perfect, he's already out. His name was Tracy. Tracy. We all thought he was insane. Okay. We, he is an insane person. This guy, Tracy, that I'm talking about, if anybody knows who this guy, Tracy B is absolute insane person. But if you like, ter- not, not the best leader, uh, not, not the best example of like off, yeah. off duty time and all this other, all these things that you're supposed to be like a good leader in the air force. But that guy, if you, if you mention his name around Damnick or around, you know, say the, the ATF Fort Bragg area, like Aberdeen, if you mention his name in those halls, those guys are like, that dude's a fucking murderer. He is the the hardest dude that I've ever worked with. Yeah. I love him and whatever. And it was so weird to hear those stories and be like, why are we forcing this guy that's so good at his craft to write reports yeah. and pretend to be this corporate nug when he all he wants to do is be on the team? Why not just let yeah. him be on the team? But I just want to break know, shit and kill people, man. I'll, like, yeah, I'm really I'll, good I'll at it. What, Tracy was the man at that shit. And he was he was legendary in the fucking community because he would he just didn't give a shit. And, and again, like, would you want him to be your supervisor as he's guiding and mentoring you through your career? I mean, no, prob- I'm probably probably not. I'm, I'm glad that you made that point, too, because it is it is two different skill sets to be a leader. Uh, and sometimes guys that make really, really good leaders and mentors, uh, it's like the, you know, the old, like, I can't do it as well anymore. So I coach. Right. And they make awesome coaches and they make great leaders because it's like, they can see the strategy and they, they, they understand the system and how it works. But it's like, you know, they're not, I wasn't such a great Bravo right rifleman, you know, but damn, I'm really good at being a team sergeant. I care about my dudes. And it's like, yeah, we, we do have a a promotion problem. And then the other point that I wanted to make too, is like, we all have those units that, that like the tier one units. And it's like, look at the way that they do things. They got E9 still kicking in doors because Bro. they understand. And it's like, we say that we want to be like them and yeah. it's like, and eventually everything trickles down. And then we're like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff that you're doing that works really well for you. Throw that shit out. Right. I just want, I just want your gear and your, your freaking, you know, it's like, Oh, what's, what's the latest optics that you guys are using? Right. You know, the very the first train, time, not the training and the methods. Like you guys keep that. The, but yeah, don't, yeah. Don't take the overarching philosophy of it. Let's just talk yeah. about material <laughs> solutions. I, uh, the first time that I kind of realized that was a reality, like those, those tier one units having very high rank people that were still going out on target. My, uh, great, uh, team leader of mine, his name's Rob. Love that dude. So Rob like looks at me as we're walking in he's like, Hey, you want to brief the, the CSAR PR plan? I was like, yeah, no problem, man. I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. Like I, I'd briefed a bunch of times before, like with him and, you know, he talked me through it and it was all good. So we go up to Mosul, we're doing this thing and I walk in and I, I start to brief and it's like introductions and it's like Sergeant major, Sergeant major, Sergeant major, Sergeant major, master Sergeant, Sergeant major, Sergeant major, Sergeant yeah. major. And I was like, that's who are all these, is there some sort of head shed going on? And they were like, Oh no, that's the assaulters. Yeah, and I a, was like, a word? <laughs> that's, 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 <laughs> welcome to, I, I, I can't remember what the numbers are, but I want to say something ridiculous, like 17% yeah. of all E9s in the army work at that special mission. Unit. Right. <laughs> like it's yeah. something, it's something insane. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the pipe hitters association, brother. But no, Indeed. I wish, um, like another thing that I wish that, that they would filter down, um, from that organization is I wish that they would look into ODAs and, and give us that ability to in special forces to like continue to promote without having to like, like we were saying earlier, take a next, next level up position. Like you should be able to have E eights and E nines on an ODA. And it's like, they're still Bravo one and echo one on the ODA. Cause they're like, I'm just, I like what I do, man. Like, leave me here. I don't want to be the team sergeant. I don't want to be. Yeah. Well, the, the, the big military has a real hard time understanding that stuff. Right. Cause like if, if I was a, a E six and I didn't want to be the, the element leader or the team leader or whatever, and you put like an E five over the team, I would be fine with it. I'd be I totally fine care. with it. Oh my God. I, like, dude, we like, made the joke. He's going to be awesome. you like, yeah. I don't know these guys and he's capable. I don't care how much he gets paid, but he's in that right. position that he's going to take it. But I think in like the greater military construct, they're like, no, no, no. Like an E5 can't tell an E6 what to do. It's like, no, we're all on the same team. I'm going to do what right. I tell them to do anyway, because we all want to do yeah. the same stuff. 
Uh, but I just don't think that mentality and there's too much big green, big blue until you get to those, you know, walled off compounds um, to escape that kind of stuff. There's too much of that right. mentality that that bleeds over. It's so and funny. We, I don't know how many like, uh, you know, exercises and events and evaluations that I've been on, but like, you know, the guy getting evaluated, whatever he's like, you know, I'm going to pick the team. I have never seen people fight. There's a chief at Alaska that's getting ready to retire his op initials or a DA. But, uh, I distinctly remember a time like we're doing, you know who you are, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who you are, DA what's up. <laughs> um, but uh, nobody listens to this podcast, but, uh, I distinctly remember this time, like this real world, pretty tough problem came down and I was, you know, I think I was the flight chief at Kirtland or director of training or something. And we start playing it for this really complex mission that involved a lot of high angle scenarios and, and some stuff. It was a civilian body recovery that we were trying you, to turn. You PJs and your ropes, dude. I love those ropes. As soon as you doll. get a chance, dude, they all just. <laughs> Listen, this one was valid. Dude jumped off a bridge. They couldn't recover them. And they, they tried a bunch of times and like almost killed a couple sheriffs in boats and stuff. And they were like, Hey, how can we do this? And we're like, dude, we can, we can literally just like propel down and then get him and come back. Anyway, I've spent my whole life training for this moment. <laughs> I know. So hilarious. But this guy, like, you know, somebody that I emulate, right? Like he's the chief yeah. of the Alaska unit. He's amazing. Like prior Marine, uh, prior Marine sniper before he became, if he just stoic, very quiet dude. And it's hilarious. Like the second that it came out, he was like, okay, Aaron, you're going to be the team leader for this one. And I, he was like, I'm going to be your EL. And I was like, you piece of shit. I was like, now I got to do all this stuff. And you're going to be the, like, you're doing that. Cause you know, you're going to be the guy to just do the problem. He's like, PJ element leader, man, best job in the air force. <laughs> it's just like, all right, dude. Uh, hey, you want to so, change it, dude, get, get promoted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what you get. So, I mean, yeah. that, that kind of brings us to now, man. And sometime along this way, you started really, uh, finding a different calling yeah. and finding a way that you wanted to communicate a bunch yeah. of different stuff in your life. And it, it started off with, with common freaking sense and, and you yep. and you and your dad, um, and now it's involved, uh, evolved, excuse me, to, uh, you know, I came with fire. So obviously Brendan, yeah. you, all of us are, are friends here and, and we love each other and share each other all the time. But what made you want to get in to that sort of, I, I hate using the word influencer. So I'll just say digital content, uh, creator. Right. What, what made you get into that space? What calling did you feel where you felt mm. like you had something specific to put out? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So one more link in the chain, uh, is I, I didn't want to, because we, we got off on that tangent a little bit about not wanting to get promoted to uh, oh, to be the sorry. team leader. And and I was like, dude, I, I want to stay with the medic thing. Like, I, I want to stay a medic on a team. Um, and I was like, you know what? If I go to selection, uh, I'll restart my team time all over and I'll go back on the on the bottom beat Delta 2 on an ODA. And I was like, that, that's what I want to do, man. So I trained up the, the last part of my second Syria deployment, came back, was on the ground for, uh, I think, five weeks straight to selection got selected uh, straight through the Q course. It was pretty cool because I didn't have to do Sears school again. Yeah. I didn't have to do Sockham Skip again. Sockham. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I basically went to the, went to the Delta course, uh, SUT did Robin Sage, reserted my language for 30 days and then boom, straight out to first special forces. group. And during that time I was, uh, I was one of the COVID Q course kids and it, the things that I saw happen when I was going through the SFQ course and the reason I went back to pick up this part of the chain is, is that's where it, it answers your question. I remember I came back from selection the day that they shut Fort Bragg down. It was, so I got selected my, uh, third child, second child, my second child was born all in the same day. I got four of them. Okay. They run together. <laughs> I delivered, I delivered the fourth one. That's a great story. Which was one fast. of the best text messages I've ever gotten. Like, yeah, <laughs> I just remember shortly after you and I sitting around that fire and having some beers yeah. and talking shit, you're like, bro, guess what? Cause it, there was a false alarm like a couple days before. And you're like, oh, right. I think this is it. We're going to go have this baby. And I was like, man, yeah. I'm, I'm pumped. You need anything? You're like, no, we got it. And then like, you're like, yeah, false alarm. And then two days later, you're like, bro, you're never going to believe this. And you send me a picture <laughs> of your wife and your newborn. Yeah. And then yeah. the really new. And I'm like, is that a, uh what kind of hospital has a bookshelf yeah. that looks like that? That's, that's weird carpet. And he was like, man, it happened too quick. It happened at home. I was like, yeah. get the fuck out of here. Yeah, Bro, dude. You live on, you live on base. You could have got there. You just wanted to deliver the baby at home. That is not what it was. I was on my team room to go pick up a torque wrench so I could put my new optic on my rifle. Okay. <laughs> and that's what it and it went from woe to wow. And he delivered his baby in his living yeah. room. That's a real thing. Yeah. Anyway, continue. It was the bedroom, but yeah. Okay. So okay. anyway, okay. well, you know, so 
COVID was happening and it was the, you know, the, the forced vaccinations in the military. I like the day that I got selected, Caleb was born. I got my, my wife and my family out of, uh, Womack army medical center, like two hours before they shut the hospital down and quarantined it. And I'm driving around like Fayetteville, all of the restaurants are closed. Fayetteville is a ghost town. Like you could literally see tumbleweeds like rolling, rolling across the street in, uh, in Fort Bragg, the most busy military base in the world. And I remember just thinking to myself, like one, this is freaking crazy. And then two, like we're, we're really in for it. Like if they shut Fort Bragg down, Mm -hmm. like we're, we're really in for it. And this is not going to end anytime soon. And I already knew at that point that it was, it was going to get really, really bad. Um, So it was really that process of being basically confined to quarters again, you know, everybody work from home, getting ready to start the Q course. I remember distinctly uh, when I was in the, uh, the fourth battalion, getting ready to class up, we were still on like social distancing and masks, which we all know now were just completely and totally nonsense. arbitrarily made up and complete nonsense. And, we knew and, it at the time too. We, we knew, knew it at, at the time, time too. Yeah. Uh, and th- this is, this is, this is how, because I remember it's like, you know, mask, social distancing, we're forcing you all to get vaccinated or you can't graduate the Q course. Uh, but then the 2020 election season happens and the summer of love and watching people in one breath, talk about how dangerous COVID was, but then defending giant crowds and mass riots right. in the same news segment. Right. And then mostly peaceful, fiery, but mostly peaceful protests. That Chiron came out that year. Um, I remember it getting cold out there. They were just lighting some fires for warmth. That's it. Yeah. And that, that was, that was right near my hometown. That was another thing that, that really struck me is like, that was Racine. Wisconsin. That's like two hours from where I'm from. It's like, I know those, I know those streets. Right. And so watching, watching a town near my hometown, like burn and all that property damage, like really hit home for me in the whole Kyle Rittenhouse situation. Um, and so things are going off the rails. I get called into this formation, like socially speaking, things are going off the rails. I get called into this, this formation, social distancing is a thing, you know, but then we crowd like 300 green berets into this tiny room so that my cadre can rotate this laptop around and hit the safety stand down that the department uh, the secretary of defense made us all watch the extremism stand down hilarious "Mm -hmm." yeah and i remember looking around and i was like uh covid yeah no and he was just like shut up you all have to watch this and i just remember like watching these things like all happen like back to back to back nothing made any sense the social fabric was breaking down. Um, I was really disappointed in Americans. Like we, we have a, the, the structure in the military, right. Is like, this is an order. And as long as it's not illegal or immoral, like stay home, do not come into work. Right. They can order you to do that. You, you mm-hmm. give away your rights to be in the military. You voluntarily take on. I'm going to pause uniform, you right there. My dude, no you uniform do code not, of military you justice. Do not, you do not when give you, up your big R rights. We could talk about no, this in another podcast, but actually, I will not let that slide. No, I was, I was amending my statement. I'm saying you <laughs> voluntarily take on more laws. Additional saying, rest- you you I, voluntarily take right. on additional restrictions. You never give Correct. up your rights. Correct. Yeah. So don't let people search your cell phone. Also. Yeah. <laughs> face. Yeah. <Jesus. laughs> right. So. Uh, and I just remember watching all this stuff happen. January 6th happens. Uh, and the safety That was a mostly peaceful down, protest. That one was too, you know? And I just remember being really disappointed, like, in Americans. Like, I thought we were supposed to be, you know, it's like the don't tell me what to do. Like, intrepid spirit. The cowboy, Freedom, the person that liberty, went west to go make to right. the Oregon Trail. Everything about us is entrepreneurial and independent in nature. Right. And yet, like that whole summer, that whole season kind of shattered my my view on what the average American was. And and I think it did for a lot of other people too. And and funny enough, that's actually when I found ones ready. 
because I was getting ready mm. to start the Q course and, and I came across your guys' stuff on YouTube. And, and like, that's when I started watching it. And I picked up like a bunch of other podcasts because I was really interested in, in what you guys were doing over in, in Aspect War and whatever. And it was, it was cool uh, to see things on the other side of the fence as I was getting ready to go into the ODA community. But um, that, that whole experience of of watching America break down and basically like bend over and you know govern me harder daddy like I need you to tell me what to do uh really lit a fire in me that I was like you know I I took my oath to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic very very seriously and not to get too cringy on this but like this is this is how I really feel about it and I'm like I'm watching you know, I, I'm in the Q course when the withdrawal from Afghanistan happens. I watch that go down live, uh, which that really kicked me in the emotional feel bads. You know, and I went through the whole like, what was it all worth? So just like every other vet that's that's been to the Middle East. Um, <clears throat> and I was like, you know what? It's and I got I got to couch my statements because I am still active duty. So like, if you if you think that I'm like like free fire now while I'm in, just wait until I got that DD two fourteen dog. Cause like, like the receipts are coming. Like, trust me, I've got stuff that I, that I want to say, uh, but I'm, I'm a good boy and I'll say what I can, you know, but without getting too much into the foreign policy stuff, it's like, I've seen the, the mess ups of leadership and I'm like, I'm thinking about all this stuff. I'm, I'm watching these podcasts. I'm watching my fellow Americans just bend over and take it voluntarily. And I'm like, I don't think, the enemy is out there anymore and i'm like something needs to change here uh and that's that's where i kind of i it, it all started as a meme page you know and it just mm-hmm. started with like i like to point out basically that the emperor has no clothes i mean the that's absurdity basically, of yeah the absurdity of the world that's plainly apparent that's, unless you decide to pretend right. yeah yeah, exactly. Uh, and so that that's how, how it started for me. Uh, and it was just, it was fun. It was cathartic for me to to make the memes and, and to put that stuff out there. Uh, and then it, it just really grew from there. And I started to meet, like I met you uh, during during that time frame, yep. uh, which was really cool. Uh, and I've since, uh, you know, like uh, Adam Dorito, uh, I've gotten to know that guy has become like a really, really good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, some other names that that I can't drop yet, but you know, talking to people behind closed doors and it's just like, uh, things have just kind of started to snowball to where it's like those connections get made and the network is starting to grow. Uh, and it's, it's really become basically just like, I guess to sum it all up in one sentence, like, like America needs to change. Like we need to take a serious dose of Ipecac and, and, and throw this, uh, this communism up and, and extricate this demon as it were. Uh, I've got some things to say, I'm a fairly articulate guy when I'm not making jokes. Uh, and I, I think I can do something to, to help. And I've been here in the, in the special operations community for, you know, going on eight years now. Uh, I've been some places, I've seen some things and, and I think that I can be a help in this fight. And the honest God's truth is like, this is my country and I'm not going to, I'm not going to freaking give it up. I'm not going, I'm not going quietly without a fight and I yep. want to have something to, uh, to give to my four boys. Uh, yep. and then at, also at the end of the day, you know, I don't want my sons to look at me and be able to be, you know, and to, to come to the opinion, like, well, dad didn't do anything when he had a chance. It's like, I want to show them what it looks like to fight for your home. And that doesn't always have to be putting on a uniform and, and going overseas. So there's, there's yeah. a job there's a job to do boys and i'm here to get up under the apparatus i guess that's what i'm trying to say yeah for sure and I'll, I'll tell you what i don't know what it's been this weird thing and i think we've all seen it you know we we run in the same circles man we all talk to the same people and it's it's crazy finding those like-minded individuals like terminal cwo and misfit patriot and some of these other cats that you know we were really you know all aligned going towards the same way and, and you hit it you hit it perfectly is you know i think the difference between you know america writ large and you know folks you know like us here on the podcast or you're trying to find you know, through other projects or whatever is that there's this weird thing that's happening in america right now where they're like america's dying the republic is dead we can't do anything so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go prep my house and get ready for the right. shooting war to start and all this other yeah. stuff and i and I reject that wholeheartedly. Like I, yeah, I look, look how, at people and I'm like, look how Ruby Ridge turned out, dog. Like that's, right. that's the yeah, route that, you're going to go. <laughs> yeah. How'd that go? You know, there, there's one example there. Yeah. How, how, how about Waco? 
How about yeah, we just go. want to be left alone? How'd that work out when the ATF yeah. burned kids and, and children in their, in their homes? Um, but you know, one of those things is like, you're not, it's not dead. You're, you're on the ground. There's a boot on your neck. And when people do that thing and they're just like, wow, your vote doesn't count. I don't care about any of this. When, when you sign over to that sort of throw your hands up and, and whatever right. else, like you're, you're just, it, it would be as if you are, somebody is stepping on your neck and you're like, well, I mean, this guy's going to beat me. So I might as well just lay here and die. Like, what are you talking about? Get, why yeah. aren't you fighting? Why aren't you having these hard conversations? Why aren't you finding like-minded individuals and making your network as strong as possible and coalescing? And man, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to watch, you know, you through common freaking sense and then getting with Brandon and going through, yeah. you know, I came with fire. Like, man, that's, that's fantastic because there's, quite frankly, not enough voices. Um, right. You know, people, you know, the feedback that we got when we first started was, uh, you know, don't you think there's enough military dudes with podcasts? Like, what do we need another no. podcast here? No, no, there's really not. <laughs> there's, there's really not. There's enough space for a lot of voices. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Joe. Sorry. The, the, <clears throat> I think the, one of the things that we try to push is, is the starting point, I think, for a lot of these people is, is going to be finding reality, right? And getting in shape and doing all these things that we preach about, whether you're political or not, it's going to be hard to ignore reality if you actually go through hard things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we have in common. And I think that's why we push it uh, towards the, the general population so hard. It's like, if, if you just work in your office and come home and drink yourself to death and you're a fatty McFatterson, like you, you can't fight. You're not going to have any faith in yourself to fight. And so there's, there's a lot of different steps to this process where you're the, you know, getting people on board uh, process, and then also coalescing your your group of yeah. friends and like minded individuals to, uh, um, you know, support what we all need to support. Yeah, uh, one of the little speeches that I like to give is it always starts it starts at home first, right? And so, like you hit it up perfectly when you talk about strong mind, strong body. You know, it starts like inside the temple first, and then if you're a part of a family, especially as a man, like I I preach masculinity to death masculinity is not toxic get that shit out of here right it's like no sorry like you owe it to your family if you have a wife right then you owe it to her because you made vows to her you know to to protect her to protect provide and preside over those that you are responsible for you know if you have children now you're doubly responsible but what about the things that i want to do Hey man, if you wanted to stay a boy, then you should have stayed a boy, but you have man responsibilities now, man, the fuck up, you know, sorry, guys, you know, man, man up and, and go and take care of your responsibilities. So that's the house. Then your small community, everybody likes to bitch and moan about the federal government. You're right. And it's like, okay, what about your, your local township board yeah. or your county board or yep. the mayor's seat or the school board? You know, it's like, do you even know who those people are? Do you remember the last time that that vote happened? Those people have way more to do with your daily life. Right. And then, Oh, also uh, the way that federalism works is if the government tries to come in, the federal government tries to come in and tell you to do something, but you own the town, you own the County, you own the state and the state can look at the federal government and say, go kick rocks. We're yeah. not doing no, that here. Look at, look at COVID, look what happened in South Dakota and look how Iowa handled it. Right. And so on and so forth. So that's the way that federalism works. The system works. If you work the system, then you move on to the state, take care of your state. Right. So it's like one of the things that irritates the shit out of me is when people like, you know, they, they want to complain about the federal government and like, Oh, especially libertarians. Like, the worst. Oh my Listen. God. The, the libertarian party for me, like it used yeah. to mean something cool. I even described myself as a libertarian at one part. Sure. Now looking at what the libertarian party has become, like I used to right. be a, an old school liberal as well. Like that, I know that's a dirty right. word, but you know, big R independent rights. I want to be left alone. I don't want the government to tell me to do literally anything. And I want to right. be able to pursue these things. I, I'm not even in that case. I'm not even right. in that, in that bucket anymore because it's become such yeah. a perverted, uh, amalgamation of what it used to be and what it used to represent that it, it's not even, it, you're, you're not an old school classical liberal anymore because that person doesn't exist. And the person that, that's saying that, that line moved, like, exactly. That's 100%. not what that means anymore. Yeah, right, it is right. Yeah. Well, and being a libertarian is kind of like a, a chick going through a lesbian phase in college. Like we all have to do it right to, and, and then like get it out of your system. But, but not like on a, on a more serious note, like libertarianism, I say is the, is the politics of the ignorant and the lazy. Yeah. Like it, it you can say you don't want, it, it sounds, it briefs well on paper to say yeah. like, I just want the government out of my life. But now you're just talking about chaos and, and 
uh you well, know, you know, like the horseshoe theory anarchy. of politics, right? Like, it, yeah, yeah, especially like uh, anarcho capitalism is a, is the newest, right? Like, rise amongst the libertarians. And I know there's going to be a person out there that's like, yeah, you're getting it. And I'm like, sorry, mm, dude, you shut up. The, the, like, libertarians and communists actually they're so close they dude, cross so, so, oh, in the idea that there can be like a utopia on earth yeah. just the one says well we just need all the power so that we can make utopia and the other right. one says no nobody should have any power so that there is no utopia so and there like, are dude, no structures adam, of power right adam and eve and their first two sons had utopia because they were the only people and there was no government and look what happened like immediately right. one person killed the other like yeah. dude it's like <laughs> sorry um but yeah, it's you don't get to sit around and complain about the government when you're the person that also goes. It's like, okay, well, are you registered to vote? Well, no, because none of it matters. You a, are the problem. That's a problem. I am talking right to you, man. Right. Like you are the problem. problem. The, the system works if you work the system, and you're not like okay. So the car is careening off the cliff, and you don't even want to try and put a hand on the steering wheel. And you're like, nah, dog, man. This, is, right. this is already a thing. Yeah, I'm this, just gonna this eat is, this. This is fine. <laughs> oh, well. Dude, Chris, we have covered a lot of ground. You yeah. can come back on any single time that you want. I can't wait to be uh, on. I think we're doing a flag day episode over on. I we are fire. I'm yeah. excited it's, to get that. It's going to be going. awesome. Yeah. Um, but you guys are doing great things over there, man. We can't, Thank you. We can't uh, recommend everybody to go find a listen. If, if you care about American politics, if you care about world events, if you care about things that are actually important to you and that you should start wrapping your head around. Go listen to I came with fire. Um, Chris and Brendan are doing great stuff over there. It's a couple of SF bros over there. <laughs> this this is true. Uh, you know what? Uh, you know uh, what SF stands for? I told Brandon <laughs> this the other day. You know what SF stands for? Hmm. Freaking stupid, dude. <laughs> Hilarious, Chris. We ended on every every single time we ended on the same thing, man. You have gone through adversity from you know uh, the problems with EOD, and then it, you know from Signals Intel to CA to the Sockham course to to weaseling yourself, um, everything to to putting yourself out there in the in the digital space, which none of that is easy. Um, but a lot of people listen to this podcast to try to figure out how to do something that isn't easy. So what advice would you give to those folks that are at the beginning of their journey? Yeah, two things that I like to tell people, man. Uh, one is like you have the collective knowledge of mankind at the palm in the palm of your hand with the internet. Like if you have something that you want to learn how to do, it takes you like 10 minutes on YouTube to get basically a, like an almost uh, collegiate level of knowledge about any, any topic that you want. So I didn't know how to do any of this before I started. Uh, and I literally went on to, to the Googles and went on to YouTube, actually duck, duck, go. Cause you know, Google is obviously. Obviously. Yeah. But, I, I, yeah, I can't believe obviously. you said duck, duck, go. You're almost there. How about, how about brave, uh, with a VPN and a tour? Uh, Come on. I, grow I, up. I so much to learn. I mean, Come anyway, on. so, um, you still have yeah, to face so, me on this phone. So I still, <laughs> yeah, this, this is true. Yeah, I'm almost, you've, you've almost literally, made it. you've literally <laughs> sacrificed security for comfort. Oh um, yeah. I have to go think about my life choices. now. <laughs> You were supposed to be the chosen one. So uh, basically, I, I just jumped on the internet, man. And I spent like three weeks taking myself to like podcasting university. And I learned how to run OBS. And I learned how to run the, the platforms. And I learned how to, to do the video editing. And then I went out and I, I just started researching pages that were doing it right. And like, man, I, I like the way that that guy looks. I started building out the, the studio, learned about lighting, like things I had nothing to do. You know, I, I came out of the audio world uh, back before I joined the military. Uh, so it was like, man, I, I learned about all that. And then I feel like I'm finally starting to, to know just enough to be dangerous <laughs> after, after all of that. And then my second piece of advice to those people would just be like, and then you just have to like sack up and then go do it. You know, the internet, the internet is a lawless wasteland. You know, it's like, it's like fallout Vegas out there. And you're going to get nothing but hate. One of the things I love about Aaron loves America that you like, you get in that comment section and you're just like dropping bows all day. And I love it. I prefer to let the memes speak for themselves and then let everybody argue in the comments. Cause it's fun for me. It's like watching midget wrestling, but yeah, like nice. you actually, you actually like climb in there and just like, you're, you're oh. in the mud with people, you know, dude, my uh, favorite I recommend it. when people don't realize that Aaron and I are friends and I'll like leave like a sarcastic comment in there and people will be like, what is your problem? This is what he's actually saying. And it's, it's the funniest time. thing in the world. Yeah, talk to my friend like that. Like, yeah, I, was, yeah, okay. I literally, I had to go to the comment section one time. I was like, guys, I've, I've he's, 
my business partner. I love him. I, we, he's watched my kids. I watch his kid. Like we, <laughs> we're really, really good friends. It was a joke. You don't, you don't need to flame him. That'd uh, be hilarious, man. Chris, thanks so much for coming on, dude. Open thanks invite. for having me let's, on guys. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get you back on. I'm looking for the, looking forward to that flag day episode. I'm already so. looking forward to it, man. Hell yeah. I'll come Chris on anytime Ambrose. that you guys want. Hell yeah. I came with fire, common freaking sense. Go follow him on Instagram at common freaking sense. And it's a common spelling. So common freaking sense, C E N T S. Yep. So go follow him at common freaking sense. Go check out uh, everything he's doing with, I came with fire and make sure to follow Brandon as well. Yes, uh, and that's about it. That's all I got. Trent, you got anything else? No, man. Appreciate having you on. Uh, I always enjoyed stories of guys that have made it to where everybody says they want to be. And it wasn't easy. And that's, I think that's the most important you know, lesson that we can always put out there is like, Hey, it wasn't a straight path. You know, you didn't have all the answers, yeah. but you figured it out along the way and you made it there. So it's awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Man. Thanks, Chris. Talk next time, bro.